<laughs> that's because the little uh, is oh that's I hadn't thought about that then something else comes it's like oh I really haven't thought about that and it's like then the next one is like are you guys are you guys getting what I'm getting at? Have, have you thought about that too and at the end it's like I got it I got it it's great <laughs> so if you stick if you stick with it if you stick with it the whole time that's the process that you're going to go through, okay? And so, um, um, it will be worth it. I know some of you have come a distance, but it will be worth it if you stick it out. So, um, what I've done uh, all last year in presenting is I have three, I have four, four PowerPoints. So, three of them is just to lay a foundation in, di in, a di in different ways. And then the fourth one is to dig into it. The fourth one is uh, teaching the calendar itself. Okay, but I feel as though if you go straight into the calendar, it, it's an injustice uh, without laying the foundation behind it. Who, who, uh, who are the people and, you know, and, and what's the significance of importance of it and why? All right. So uh, that's, um, that's my intro cause. Uh, when I was a when I was a, so, uh, a sophomore in high school and I took uh, uh, advanced writing or whatever, there's only one, no, there's one of two things I remember from the class. Uh, the teacher said, when you're writing a paper, say what you're going to say. They call that the topic sentence. And then say it. And when you're done, have a summary of what you said. And so that's how they said you're supposed to write so people can best follow along and, and understand what what you're saying and I found out that that works very well in communication as well so when you begin get tell people what you're going to say what you're going to talk about so they don't have to spend the first hour like what's this guy talking about where's this going so tell them up front and then give them the details and at the end say well this is what I told you and so uh, that's what I like to do and I found out that that works very very Effectively, so that's why I'm starting my process now to give you a little bit of background to say, well, this is what I'm going to be doing, this is how I'm going to be doing it, and this is what I'm going to be covering, and this is why I'm going to be covering it, so you can at least get a little bit of a perspective of where this is going as you're listening and, and, and making judgment about you know what this is all about. So, um, have we? It's we're past six. Have we started the recording? I'm just recording. Okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of like starting, at least I'm not starting the presentation, but I'm starting the intro to what I'm yeah. talking about. All right, so um, this um, teaching I've entitled uh, Restoring the Zadok Priesthood. And, and I regard this as a foundational teaching before you even get to the calendar. This must be understood before you even get to the calendar, okay? And um, here to me is the bottom line of the importance and significance of, of that teaching. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you um, um, out of the Bible. Is To me, this is the bottom line. This, this to me um, causes it to be a clincher for me, okay? And it is, it, it's Ezekiel chapter 44, Ezekiel chapter 44, in verse 15, it's who, who this is talking about. It says, the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that, that kept the, the charge of my sanctuary, <clears throat> when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come uh, near to me. Uh, to minister unto me, and they shall stand be before me to offer unto me the fat in the lamb, says Yahweh Elohim. And then it goes on to say, so we're talking about the sons of Zadok. So then it goes on to say in verses 23 and 24, and they will teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. 
All right, so we're talking about the sons of Zadok. And now the absolute clincher um, for me um, is verse 24. Verse 24 makes this an absolute for me, okay? And so verse 24 says, And in controversy they will stand in judgment, and they will judge it according to my judgments, and they shall keep my laws, my statutes, mine assemblies, and they will hallow my Sabbaths. So the God of Israel has made this decision regarding the sons of Zadok. And he has said regarding them, I regard them as they're going to be my representatives in verse 24 in controversy. And that's Torah controversy. In Torah controversy, they will stand and make the ruling. They will make the judgment about matters and they will judge it. Um, so actually what this is referring to, and this is very important, um, what he's referring to in controversy, he's referring to Deuteronomy chapter 17. He's referring to Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 8. He's referring to Deuteronomy 17, verse 8. It says, if there, are, if there arrives a matter too hard for you in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of, matters of controversy in your gates, um, you will arise and you will get to the place where the Lord your God will choose, and you will come to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge, which is a reference to Yeshua, the judge that will be in those days and inquire, and he will show you the sentence of judgment, and you will do according to the sentence which they of that place of Yahweh will choose to show you, and you will observe to do according to all that they inform you. According to the sentence of the Torah, which they will teach you, according to the sentence which they will tell you, they shall do. They shall not decline from the sentence that, that they tell you to the right nor to the left. So... In Ezekiel 44, when the Almighty says that the sons of Zadok, that they will make rulings and matters of controversy, he's talking about these verses right here. That, that they have the Torah authority to make rulings and matters of controversy. All right. So that being the case, why is that important? That it refers back to these verses because... Um, given that there's a lot of people here, probably not 100% of the people here, maybe some of you do, um, are aware that Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 8 through 11 are the verses that Orthodox Judaism and the rabbis use to, to state that they have been given the authority in the Torah from the Almighty. So, the, so here, the exact verses that Orthodox Judaism points to um, has been given an interpretation in Ezekiel chapter 44 by the Almighty that he regards that this authority regarding matters of controversy and its rulings, uh, the Almighty says he acknowledges the sons of Zadok uh, regarding those matters. So why is that important? Because they're usurpers. Because the, uh, uh, the Orthodox Jews today they weren't called Orthodox Jews 2,000 years ago. They probably started to call themselves Orthodox because in Christianity, we got the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, and so they didn't want to uh, go by the term Pharisee because, you know, it's, it, it doesn't have a good connotation. So they started calling themselves Orthodox. All right, so in the Bible, when it talks about the Pharisees, um, the Pharisees are the ones that wrote the Talmud. And the ones that wrote the Talmud, that follows the Talmud today, we call them Orthodox Jews. And um, in trying to pattern their, their act, actually, Orthodox Judaism or Judaism today is actually, if you look at history and time, it's actually a sect. It's a sect, just like in Christianity, you got your sects. You got your Baptists and your Pentecostals or whatever. It's actually a sect. Because where do we go back to? Well, we're going to go back to David and Solomon. So why do we go back to David and Solomon? Because actually, whether you're aware of it or not, and there's, a whole not, there's not a whole lot of scripture about it, although it's, 
it's an important um, understanding concept and idea. Um, and Acts chapter 15 makes a reference to it, but it's, but it's quoting um, Amos in uh, chapter 9 and verse 11. Amos chapter 9, verse 11, it says, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and I will close up the breaches thereof. Okay, so this is a prophecy of restoration. Now, Amos chapter 9, verse 11, is what's being referenced to um, in Acts chapter 15. In this famous, you know, what do we do about the Gentiles thing? And so, in making this ruling in Acts chapter 15, there's a reference to Acts chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. Uh, and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen, and I will um, build again the ruins thereof. So actually, the period of time that we're in right now, we are in the period of time of the fallen tabernacle of David. And so what do we mean by the fallen tabernacle of David? We mean that, so we have one picture that leads to another, and the first picture is in the, in the Torah itself. And that is the, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and going to the promised land is a prophetic picture of the ways of the kingdom of God. And it's to teach you all about the Messiah. So actually, um, you know how we uh, sometimes uh, refer to Christianity that they spend too much time at the end of the book and they don't understand what's at the beginning of the book? Do you know what we do when we formally go through the, 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 the Torah and the Torah portions on the, on the yearly cycle? What we do, Genesis, Exodus, Vegas, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we go through the, the first part of the book, but we don't finish the story. Because Joshua goes in the promised land, and, 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 and we forget the story of him going in the promised land and what happens, and we go back and start the beginning. So we start the story, we don't end it. But actually, their spiritual journey, they were brought out of Egypt to bring him in. Not just generically the promised land. There was a specific destination in the promised land. And that destination was Jerusalem. So in the natural, which became a spiritual picture for us, in the natural, the journey of the children of Israel out of Egypt did not get completed until King David ruled over all 12 tribes from Jerusalem. And when he did, that's when the scripture uses the word very frequently, Zion, or in Hebrew, Zion. Zion. So now, so that, that, is, that is in the natural, the completion of that journey. And so now David ruling over all 12 tribes from Jerusalem, that is a prophetic picture of the Messiah ruling over all 12 tribes in the full restoration and completion of all things. And ultimately that will be fulfilled, Messiah ruling all, over all 12 tribes in what we call the millennium, the messianic era. Or the kingdom, okay? But, that, so now we have a completion of a picture. Now we're going to start the picture all, all over again. And David, and David, and then Solomon, but really David, uh, begins the starting point of the picture again. And so, um, David, the days of David, and then Solomon becomes our starting point. And then, then what happens is things digress from, uh, from David because David ruled over all 12 tribes. But then with Solomon, uh, the kingdom gets split. So now the united 12 tribes under David, gets, it's fallen. And how things were in the days of David gets, gets fallen. David restored the worship system. We're going to see here about what's the priesthood in the days of David and Solomon. So what happens is ultimately, I'm going to show you this, I'm going to explain to you the story, um, is that... There were two priests in the days of David at the end of his life. Um, and ultimately then when David dies and Solomon takes over, there's one high priest. And that high priest is Zadok. And so now this, this is the beginning of our story. But now as time goes in the history of things, all the high priests of Israel were, were descendants of Zadok, were sons of Zadok. From the days of David, but really starting with Solomon, until uh, the 2nd century B.C. 
until one seven, around 175 BC. That happens when the Greeks and the Seleucids and Antiochus Epiphanes IV comes in and the Greeks try to bring their influence into the land of Israel, into Jerusalem, into the temple, into the high priesthood. And that's where things ultimately break down. That's the period of time when the Zadok priests are no longer the high priests. Okay, but what do we see? I'm reading from Ezekiel. I'm one of the people that believe that, that Ezekiel, Ezekiel's temple and the things going on there, I'm one of the people that believe that that's still yet something that will be fulfilled in the future. So now we see in the future we're going to have what we had in the beginning is we're going to have God's acknowledging the Zadoks and, 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 and their role and their place under Yeshua, of course. Um, uh, about um, because he sees that they were faithful as he states uh, they were faithful so actually restoring the Zadok priesthood is a part of the Elijah's ministry of restoring all things and it also is a part of restoring the tabernacle of David that's fallen so uh, in a large measure what I'm calling the Hebrew roots movement you might have whatever name for it <laughs> um, but uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement, the central purpose of it is to bring forth restoration that is remaining yet in the body of Messiah that hasn't been restored as we come to the, uh, as we come to the days of the Messiah. All right? So that's, that's the context of this teaching about restoring the Zadok priesthood and um, um, I was reflecting upon this as I learned it um, last winter. I was reflecting upon this and where its place is. And I was seeing that once I read these books and became aware of this history, which, by the way, um, I started going to church when I was five, six, seven years old. And, you know, I was consistent at it, you know. I, was, I wanted to be there. I wanted to learn. I wanted to understand. And now I've been in this Hebraic walk for 25 years. And so um, all the things that's been taught in, in the movement and, and in church, I have never heard one time, I personally have never heard one time the teaching that I'm going to get going to uh, present to you. And in part, while well, in this teaching, what I'm going to ultimately be showing you, I'm going to show you the history of the high priesthood of Israel. And I was, I, like I said, up until becoming aware of this information a year ago, I have never heard any teaching on the history of the high priesthood of Israel. And so the, the history of the high priesthood of Israel is part of understanding um, the history of, let's say it this way, in this context, um, of the Jewish people. And you have to understand and, and follow the history of the high priesthood from David and Solomon going down to 2 B.C. and what historically happened. And that story gets told in the Dead Sea Scrolls because the story and, and then the split and the difference of opinion. So ultimately, at some point in time, um, as a result of the Babylonian captivity, is where there arose this entity that was called the Pharisees. So here's an interesting thing about the Pharisees. Although they are mentioned in the New Testament, there is no mention of the Pharisees in the Hebrew Scriptures. So when, when we're at the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, there aren't any Pharisees. Okay, so uh, where, did, where did the Pharisees um, come from? Well, the, the oldest historical information we have that mentions them is is either 2nd century B.C. or 3rd century B.C. And ultimately, when uh, if you go to Art Scroll and, uh, and you get their, uh, a book that they got, The History of the Jewish People, they will, they will sort of, now this is not an absolute statement, this is um, 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 more or less what, what they do, is they kind of like start telling the story when Hillel comes out of Babylon and, and comes over. And, and when you're looking at um, explaining things going back 2,000 years ago, you're probably going to say Hillel, the, uh, the, uh, Hillel thought this and Shammai thought this. You're going to be hearing about Hillel and Shammai. Well, what happened two, three, four hundred years before Hillel and Shammai? Why did we start there? Well, so what we have in uh, Judaism, 
um, uh, what, what they, they follow and what they say has been taught and handed down is, is this entity, this thing called the, uh, the Talmud. And there's, there's two part, there's two, um, like, Babylonian and you got the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem. Of the two, the one that's more largest and more comprehensive is the Babylonian. So that's, that's, that, that's studied and, and revered, you know, a little bit stronger. Um, than the, the, the Jerusalem uh, Talmud. And so ultimately then, when, when, when they were bringing together their sect and forming, uh, and forming, forming their authority, you know what happens in your Baptist church? They try to organize things according to what the scripture says, right? Because you, know, you, you, got, you got deacons, you got elders, and you got a pastor, so they try to set it up somehow to a biblical structure, right? Well, that's what the Pharisees did. They wanted to set some thing up to a biblical structure. So what do we got going back to our biblical structure? We got, you know, the 70 judges, you know, back in the Torah. So now they got to, you know, pattern that after. So now we got this thing called the Sanhedrin. And actually, the, the Sanhedrin becomes, becomes the judicial entity of the Pharisaic sect. But you know how Judaism presents it? They present it as that's the authority of the Torah that goes back to... Mount Sinai, that's how they present it, okay? And so if you do not know this history and, 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 and the connection thereof, because that's how they present it and, and state their claim, um, if, you, if you study their writings, you're gonna study, and you're gonna see their, their claims and this and that, and though, so there are those, even within this movement, who's um, caught on to what they proclaim and therefore are, have the perspective that, you know, the Sanhedrin is the authority and we must follow their authority in all matters because they were given by God in the Torah. And by the way, we want to follow the Torah, right? right. So, so that's the argument uh, that, they, that they want to make. But ultimately, if you go back and think, go back to the beginning, in the days of King David, did we have the Pharisees? No. In the days of King David, uh, did, the Zadok, did the Zadok priest in the days of King David, did he teach the people that there's a written Torah and there's an oral Torah? No. No. So, so therefore, if we go back, I'm going to call that the beginning because the roots is going back to the beginning. If we go back to the beginning, the, the high priesthood of Israel wasn't teaching oral Torah, but now we come along ultimately... Uh, there comes a period of time where there's a rise of the sect of the Pharisees. And by the way, if, if I can phrase it this way, there was a need there that they filled. What was the need? The Jewish people were scattered into Babylon and there was a danger that they would lose connection to the Torah if they didn't have somebody that would teach them and, 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 and bring them together as a community and keep them together as a community. And the rabbis filled that role. We might not even have a Jewish people today if it wasn't for the rabbis fulfilling that role, okay? So we can't dismiss how God has, has uh, used the, the, the rabbis in preserving and helped to preserve the Jewish people. But nevertheless, uh, if we go back to the Torah, who did the Almighty give us? Who's to teach the Torah to the people? The priests. Right, it was the priests. The priests, priests the Levites. Okay, so if the priests, the Levites, are to teach the Torah, how do we get rabbis? Usurpers. Okay, so uh, what happens is when there was that need in Babylon and in the scattering of the people, and like we can't go to Jerusalem because, you know, since we had the first temple, um, all of Israel life is centered around the temple. Now we're way over here in Babylon. Okay. Um, so how are we going to keep the Torah in the hearts and the minds of the people? Well, there was a group of, of people that rose up, that studied, and that were learned, and uh, they became accepted by the people um, who, who we call rabbis. But then at some point in time, if you think, think through the process, and a Jew that would know the Torah, that it's the priests, they would have a very logical question for you know, the teachers that's out there teaching them. Uh, whether they had at that time been accepted formally or not. And they would say, okay, 
But the Torah says that the priests are to teach the people. So what gives you your authority that we should listen to you, that what you're saying is, you know, now you're the representative of God. Why would she listen to you? And you know what ultimately, if you put two and two together, became their answer? They came up with this doctrine of oral Torah. So like, uh, yeah, we have the authority because why? Because our authority goes back to Mount Sinai. So ultimately within the Pharisaic sect, they were in Babylon. And I read in the history of the Jewish people um, from Art Scroll um, that uh, the Jewish people were in Babylon for a thousand years. Basically, I'm rounding off, from 500 BC to 500 AD. Now America's only been 250 years. So you, so you multiply this by four times, and if, if, if you and your generations have been in America for a thousand years, you're gonna pick up American culture. Okay, if you're in Babylon, you're going to pick up a, a Babylonian culture. Besides that, sometimes it happens in the course of history that we have events happen, you know, like uh, COVID and the vaccine, and they come along and they tell you, like, oh, you better get vaccinated or I'll sure I can have, have a job. You can't fly. Uh, you can't do this. And so, like, you're pressured, right? So in Babylon, there's got to be pressure from the Babylonian official. you got to do things in Babylonian way. you got to listen to what the king says. So there's pressure, and if you don't adhere to the pressure, then maybe we may be extinct as a people, so we got to learn how to survive, right? And so um, um, uh, apparently it seems that, that the rabbis did not choose to fight a fight about the calendar. While they were in Babylon, what they did is they took the Babylonian calendar, they took the Babylonian calendar and they just adapted it uh, to like to Leviticus 23. Okay, and so, so actually, first of all, you take Ezekiel 44, and to me, if, if, if there was, you know, circumstantial evidence I got to share with you, you know, you need to accept it because of this. Have you considered this? Have you considered that? Have you considered that? And then have you considered all the evidence? And is the evidence weighty enough for you to say this is what we should do? Well, rather than that, it's like, to me, it's like, well, wait a second. I have something explicitly told to me in Ezekiel 44. And so now I can go to Ezekiel 44 and I can say, well, that, that's enough to convince me. If the Almighty says that the sons of Zadok are going to rule in matters of controversy, then am I going to accept that, that, that he sees things that way or am I not? So I decided I was going to, I need to accept because there, oh, there's a, a controversy. And today, there's, there's issues about when you do the festivals and what, what, what calendar and you do it this way, that way, or whatever. But what I did not know and what's not told to us either in Christianity or Judaism, I only, I only found out by my um, uh, understanding the history and learning about the, the, the history and what, what went on in the Qumran community as revealed by the scrolls is there was, there was around a 250 year argument over the calendar amongst the Jewish people. A 250 year argument amongst the Jewish people over the calendar. You weren't told that in Christianity. You weren't told that in Judaism. And you haven't been told that in the Hebraic roots, by and large. <laughs> Rabbi Yoshi. Okay. And so, um, what, what was the argument about? The argument was about the Zadok priests had followed a calendar which they claim um, they didn't originate with. It's not their calendar that they came up with. According to their claim, it came from Enoch. You know, the Enoch back in Genesis, he was given the calendar of which it got passed down and, and they're still following. That's their claim. Um, compared to the, the Pharisees, um, now they're following um, a Babylonian calendar. And so I was shocked one day, a few years ago, about, I don't know, three, four years ago. I was, I was sitting, all this thought came to my mind was, you know, I'm gonna think I'm gonna put into a Google search Babylonian calendar. Because you know what, like I said, uh, for those of you who was here earlier, I was introducing myself and I said, uh, Hebraic Heritage Ministry has been since 1995 and I went into full-time ministry in 2002. And so I've been in this for a while, but you know, all those years, 20 years, 25 years, and I, I you know, how many conferences I've been to and, how, and, 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 and et cetera. I said, you know, uh, I've not heard one time in this movement anybody ever give a message on, let me, te let me give you a teaching on the Babylonian calendar. I've never heard of one person do that. 
So I, I, I didn't know anything about it. So when I put in Babylonian calendar and, and the, the results come up, it like, it shocked me. It should have been obvious, but it shocked me. It's an, it's an absolute no-brainer that uh, Nisan and Adar and Tammuz, um, those are Babylonian month names. I mean, there's no debate that those are Babylonian month names. Even in the Talmud, it says there's Babylonian month names. And all you got to do is look up Babylonian calendar and see what the Babylonian month names of the Babylonian calendar, and those are the names. Okay, so what's the probability that we have Babylonian month names, but we're not following the Babylonian calendar. What's the probability of that? Slim to none. Slim to none. Yeah. And we got Babylonian month Slim. names, it's because we're following the Babylonian calendar. Okay, so first of all, to me, the fact that, that um, uh, Judaism is following a Babylonian calendar should not be any dispute. It's blatantly obvious if you, if you just open up your eyes and, and examine and, and look at it. And then on top of that, we got Ezekiel chapter 44 that says, In matters of controversy, the sons of Zadok will rule. Well, now by going and studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, I learned um, that they followed a calendar. And that calendar was different than the Pharisaic calendar. And so then, therefore, it's not this way today, but back then is whoever's calendar that you followed is the authority that you submitted yourself to. So if you follow the Zadok priest, you're going to follow their calendar. And if you, if you feel as though your authority are the Pharisees or the rabbis or the Sanhedrin, you're going to follow their calendar. So the calendar became a litmus test regarding whose authority that you accept as the authority. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure you're going to be in agreement with me who your authority is. Mm -hmm. Your authority is God the Father. Um, um, the God of Israel, your authority is him through Yeshua. Correct. Mm -hmm. And him through Yeshua, the, his authority comes down to his word. The sons of light. And, and, <laughs> and so the word becomes my authority. And so the authority there says in Ezekiel chapter 44 that the sons of Zadok, that the Almighty says he recognizes that in matters of controversy that the sons of Zadok, um, he's going to acknowledge them. Well, now if I go back historically and see that there really was a controversy, and pri there's, there's all types of issues, but the big overriding issue was the calendar. Mm -hmm. Th that there was a controversy of that, then I know where, I know where Yah sits in the controversy. He's going, he already stated in Ezekiel 44, he sits with the sons of Zadok. And so... Uh, that's why when, when all this came together for me, that's when, to me, it was, I got to change. <laughs> I, I need to share with others. I got to change. Because I started doing Passover in 1994. I started doing Sukkot in 1998. And all these years, so we're talking over, what, 25 years? I, by and large, have been doing the festivals, including last year, according to the, the Jewish calendar or the Babylonian calendar. Because I... I may have known a little bit that, that that's what was going on, but I didn't know an answer. But last winter when I studied, it's like, oh, now I, now I know the answer, now I, and I got the explanation. I can even share it with others so that um, I believe this is Yah's timing for us to go forward in this because when I was reflecting upon this, um, uh, this is what I believe Yah um, explained to me. Um, first of all, we are in the days of Elijah, right? And the days of Elijah precede the coming of the Messiah. What are the days of Elijah? The days of Elijah are days of restoration. So something I had never thought before. I, 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 so uh, Yah put this thought within me that the items within the Ark of the Covenant... Are, are the areas of the end time um, uh, spirit of the ministry of Elijah. Elijah's ministry is represented by the three items in the ark. I never thought about that before. No one ever said that before. So upon this reflection, Yah put it in my spirit, that thought. And, and so here's how this would, it would be. So you've got, uh, you got the Ten Commandments. 
So that's generally the restoration of just, we need to return to the Torah. That's represented by the Ten Commandments. So the golden pot of manna is the teaching of the two houses and Messiah's coming to gather, unite the, the uh, exiles of Israel to fulfill Ezekiel chapter 37, the two sticks becoming one. That is, that is personified by the golden pot of manna. How is the golden pot of manna uh, representing that? Well, when, when were the children of Israel uh, 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 given manna? In the, wilderness. In the wilderness. But what is the wilderness? The wilderness, the historical <laughs> wilderness, is a prophecy of the end time gathering of the exiles. So it, the, 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 we, you associate the manna with the exodus. And so it represents the exodus. So it's a prophetic picture of the greater exodus. And so now the third one, um, you know, we haven't really come into, and that's what he's asked, having us come into, and that's Aaron's rod that budded. It's Aaron's rod that budded. So the restoration of the Zadok priesthood and the return to the Zadok calendar is the prophetic, the prophetic fulfillment of Aaron's rod that budded. It's the prophetic fulfillment of Aaron's rod that budded. Okay, so um, now, since we've been studying the Torah for so long, um, we go through the Torah portions uh, uh, each week. So uh, in, the, uh, in the, the Torah portion where it talks about uh, the Korah rebellion, um, uh, do you remember, do you remember actually what the rebellion was about? What, what was Korah wanting and, and, and those with him? What was he actually wanting? What was he pursuing? And what was called his rebellion? They were trying to take the place of Aaron. That's exactly right. Actually, it says it right here. He, you said it right here. Um, it, it says in uh, Numbers chapter 16, Moses said to Korah, Here I pray you, sons of Levi, is it, just, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle? Look, all the other tribes don't get to do that. Is it a small thing that he's honored you that you get to do this service in the tabernacle? But look at this. Um, but verse 10, but you seek the priesthood also? You see, that what's called the core rebellion is is the, the Levites who weren't sons of Aaron wanted to have the position of the Aaronic priesthood. So we got a Torah portion about that issue. And what did Yah think of that issue? Ultimately he said, first of all, he judged it. He judged it, there was some death involved in it. And then he said, okay, I, I want you to take, uh, uh, you, you know, and, and put on each of the 12 tribes of Israel and, and the one that buds is the one I've chosen. And, and so we, we have the tribe of Levi and then Aaron's rod. Now, now this lesson, this lesson was so important to Israel that the lesson of it, he's, the thing that represented the lesson, Aaron's rod that budded, it was so important. It was put in the ark. Not only in the ark, in the ark, in the holy of holies. Not to ever forget it. That is an elevated, I mean, the ark itself, you know, that's the presence of Yah. You know how significant the ark was, but now it's in the holy of holies. So this is like way up there in elevated um, uh, holiness to Yah, this particular issue. Now, why, why is that such an important issue to him? So how, how did Aaron and his sons get that position? Uh, they got the position by what's called a statute, that is a decree by the God of Israel. Now that word in Hebrew and, uh, and, and what it communicates is it's, uh, it's a ruling by somebody in authority because they're in authority to make the ruling, they make the ruling and it doesn't even have to be explained and it doesn't even have to make sense to you. But now if you acknowledge the authority, you're going to do it, whether you understand it or agree with it or not. <coughs> but if you don't acknowledge the authority, then you're not going to do it. So it's a, it's a test of authority. So this was an issue of the testing of the authority of the God of Israel. 
whether they're going to honor his decree regarding Aaron and his sons. So actually, by not honoring that decree, they were actually rebelling against the Almighty himself. And the Almighty couldn't, couldn't uh, tolerate the rebellion in front of Israel. They couldn't teach Israel rebellion. And so that's why you got the judgment. So are you getting a picture of how I'm trying to amplify this issue and the importance of this issue? So all of this now has become my background set up so that you're just not coming over here. Okay, someone's coming in town to do a teaching. I wonder what this is about. Okay, I think I'll do it. <laughs> Okay, that, that, that this is a significant and important matter, okay? So uh, now, this teaching is now teaching about the history of the high priesthood of Israel, okay? And, and, and so this is important because Yah decreed uh, um, that Aaron and his sons would have the priesthood. All right, so here in Exodus chapter 28, is where it says that Aaron and his sons, they are to minister in the priest's office. And so uh, Aaron's four sons are Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. All right? The, all the high priests are supposed to come from his four sons. Now, you're going to be able to see um, the importance of this later on in the presentation. It won't grab you so much now. But as I saw the full picture of this, I realized... Um, and this is a principle of the Torah. The principle of the Torah is biblical history's prophecy. So that when Aaron took a wife from the tribe of Judah, him marrying um, a wife from the tribe of Judah, this is a prophecy about Yah bringing together the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah. So how is he going to bring together the tribe of Judah? Because from the tribe of Judah... From David was going to come the Messiah. From the tribe of Levi, from Aaron and his sons was going to become the priesthood. And ultimately, I'm going to show you that priesthood is going to uh, narrow down to the Zadok priesthood. All right? So that's how it's prophetic. So now Aaron has four sons, but Nadab and Abihu, they offer strange fire, so they get zapped. All right? So we're not having any high priest through their line. And so then who's left in Numbers 3-4 is Eleazar and Itamar. That's where the priests are going to come down through. And then we have this story in the Bible about uh, Pinhas or Phineas, as I pronounce it. And um, uh, Phineas is a son of Eleazar. He's the son of Eleazar. So you know the story. Things was going on and he did this noble act. And so um, um, I, I know that probably a lot of people are, are familiar with he was promised this covenant of peace, but are you as familiar with the other promise in Numbers 25, verse 13, that it says he will have it, his seed after him, the covenant of the everlasting priesthood. Mm -hmm. So he was promised an everlasting priesthood. Now, this doesn't say how it's going to happen. It doesn't explain when it's going to happen. you got to continue reading the history of Israel and follow the history, and you'll find how that prophecy gets fulfilled, and this PowerPoint is going to show you how that prophecy gets fulfilled. So then uh, when the children of Israel go into the promised land, they take the tabernacle in, and there was a number of years the tabernacle was pitched in Shiloh, or they would say in Hebrew, Shiloh. And, and, and during that time... Eli uh, was the Lord's priest at a particular time. Now, ultimately, what I'm going to show you about Levi is Levi is of the lineage of Itamar. That's the reason why I'm showing you this. Eli. Yeah. yeah. He's of the lineage of Itamar, not Eleazar. Itamar. <laughs> so, how? Well, um, Eli had a grandson named named Ahitub. Eli has a grandson named Ahitub. And Ahitub has a son named Ahimelech and a grandson named Abiathar and he was a priest at the time of David. So I'm just showing you that, that 
Abiathar is of the line of Eli, who is of the line of Itamar. Not of the line of Eleazar. Okay? And Abiathar of the line of Eli, of the line of Itamar, is a priest in the days of David. And so we are told in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 3, that um, Itamar, that Ahimelech was of the line of Itamar. Ahimelech was of the sons of Itamar. So, what I just showed you here in these verses, these three, four verses, I basically grabbed from the Jewish Encyclopedia article on Eli. And I took the verses that they quoted there. It says, he's a high priest at Shiloh and judge over Israel. He was, he was a descendant of Aaron's fourth son, Itamar. And then it says, this is how we know that because of this verse, that verse, that verse, that verse. Okay, and that's what I showed you. So now, Eli, a descendant of Itamar, is given a prophecy because, you know, he didn't tend to his sons very well. And Yah didn't like that his sons were, uh, were the way they were. So uh, he sends a prophet to him, and, uh, and he prophesies that the days are going to come that uh, Eli's house is going to be cut off. So the prophetic word is given, and then there's a confirmation of the prophetic word. It's a very hard and difficult confirmation. The confirmation is... Uh, that your two sons in one day are going to die. How's that for a confirmation of a prophecy? All right, so now we have that it happens in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 11, <clears throat> that the two sons of Eli were slain. So now we have the prophecy and the confirmation of the prophecy. So now, once we have, right here, once we have the sign of the prophecy in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 34, the very <clears throat> next verse, in verse 35 it says, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he will walk before my anointed forever. So he's proclaiming a judgment. He's proclaiming a judgment on the line of Ithamar while then uh, proclaiming that he's going to raise up a faithful priest or faithful priesthood. All right. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to see the background of how that prophecy that was given to Eli gets fulfilled. Okay? We're going to show how the prophecy that was given to Eli gets fulfilled. Here's the story behind it. That um, Abiathar, who was of the line of Itamar, he was a priest along with Zadok during the days of David. And initially, Abiathar was with David, helped David, <laughs> supported David. For example, Abiathar helped David to flee and escape this situation that's mentioned here. And as well, Abiathar helped David by, um, he showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. So he's with David, helping David, supporting David. And um, David... His fourth son was named um, Adonijah. So his fourth son's named Adonijah. So David is basically on his deathbed. And that's how 1 Kings 1.1 1, 1 starts out. David's on his deathbed. And Adonijah, his son, says to himself, Okay, I'm going to be king now. So Adonijah here, he's the fourth son of David. He's the fourth son of David. And um, when Adonijah then went out and proclaimed himself to be the king after David, Abiathar the priest was with him in that proclamation. He was with him in the proclamation. Abiathar the priest, they helped following Adonijah. So then what happens is Nathan the prophet, in learning and hearing that Adonijah is doing this, along with Zadok the priest, um, they go... And, and they approach David, Zadok the priest and, and Nathan the prophet. Um, two things. Number one, they were not a part of the proclamation of Adonijah being king. They were not with Adonijah. And then 
Nathan the prophet went to tell uh, King David, he's on his deathbed, he said, now listen, um, um, uh, did you desire that Adonijah to be king after you? Is, is that your wishes? Is that your desire? And uh, David said, no. Um, uh, fetch for me Bathsheba. And uh, he says, now I had already said, and I had already sworn by the Lord God of Israel, that um, uh, your son Solomon, our son Solomon, he is going to be king after me. And so then um, he goes and tells uh, David and Zadok to go anoint Solomon as the king. And so he, they do. And so Zadok the priest anoints uh, Solomon. And uh, then the word gets back to Adonijah. That, uh, king da that King David has made Solomon the king. And so now Adonijah is af afraid of his life. He goes, he goes, grabs a hold of the horns of the altar. So he's, this is a Hebraic act and he's asking for mercy. He's, he's asking for the sparing of his life by grabbing hold of the horns of the altar. So like where he stands. Yeah. And so, but Solomon says, mm, I see what you're doing, but uh, he, he, here's how it is, okay? Um, if you're guilty, you're going to die. But if you're innocent, you're going to live. That's what he tells him. And then he says, go back home. So um, Solomon says, go back to your house here. And then the days are now approaching. David's on his last breath that he should die. And then David ends up dies. He, he gets buried when he, and when he dies. And of course, Solomon, his son, takes over the over the king, over the, the, the throne. And um, um, so there's a, a, a background story to what happens next. So at, when King David, right here, is on his deathbed, um, you know, he goes, you know, what can we do to make you feel better? Okay, uh, how about if we fetch this, like, this young beautiful girl, young, young right girl and let him lie next to him? You know, maybe that will uh, vitalize him yeah. a little bit. It's so, he didn't lay with her. Yeah, yeah. He, didn't, he didn't sleep with her. Yeah, so they, they, they go get uh, Abishag, the Shunammite, and she goes, does this. So she lays behind him, but it says the king knew or not. Um, and so then um, Adonijah then, he wants to have her, uh, what, what's, what's her name now? Wants to have Abishag to be his wife. Well, because of her good looks and things like that, Solomon knew, you know, this is, this is probably got to come back to haunt me if I let this thing happen. And that uh, Adonijah does not want this for out of the pureness of his heart. And so he goes, um, and he says, well, you know, maybe if Bathsheba um, goes and presents this to Solomon, maybe I got a chance. So he says, Bathsheba, will you go and ask if I could have the, um, her as my wife? And so Bathsheba goes in. And uh, then uh, Solomon uh, responds, ah, uh, no, I smell a skunk. And he says, as the Lord lives, um, Adonijah will be put to death this way. So he gets his servant and Adonijah gets put to death. And so now we go back to Abiathar because Abiathar participated in the event. So uh, Solomon goes to Abiathar and said, okay, now because you participated in this event, um, that to proclaim Adonijah king, you deserve death too. However, you carried the ark of the covenant for David, my father, and because you did, um, um, I'm going to spare your life. You're not going to die. Um, however, you're going to live, but, <coughs> sorry, you're fired. You are not going to be the high priest anymore. So this is the long story. So you can see this verse right here. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 27. Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being high priest that it might fulfill the word of the Lord that he spoke concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy that says that, that your house is going to be cut off. What that means is from this day, from this day, because what happens next is who's the high priest? It says in First Kings, First Chronicles twenty nine twenty two, that Zadok is now Zadok is now the sole priest, and so 
From the day that Zadok became the high priest, there was never a high priest in Israel from the sons of Itamar. Because of the prophecy. Right. Okay, so now where are the high priests coming from? There's no Nadab and Abihu. We got the prophecy of, of uh, uh, to uh, Itamar uh, that's got to be cut off. So now the high priests are only got to come from Eleazar. Yeah. And you know who Phineas is? Phineas yeah. is, is the son of Eleazar. And you know who Zadok the priest is? He's of the line of Eleazar. He's of the line of yeah. Phineas. So this is going to be how the promise is going to be fulfilled to Phineas. Okay? So um, this is how it looks in, in picture form, that Aaron has four sons, Nadab and Abihu, they get zapped, and we have Itamar left, but through Eli, we got the prophecy that, um, that uh, his house would be cut off. So now this uh, Aaron and his sons, the line goes from Eleazar to Phineas to Zadok, and then ultimately the Zadok priests are still the priests in, in Ezekiel chapter 44. Yah acknowledges them. So, um, from this point forward, um, the high priests in Israel are, are of the line of Zadok. They're called the sons of Zadok. So this is where we get, we kind of start here with David, then Solomon, that this is our, our beginning point. And then, what, so with Zadok the priest. So once there comes a point in time where we don't have in the high priest of Israel Zadok priests, mm -hmm. now the tabernacle of David has fallen. It's not like it was with David and Solomon. Was that last one, was it a Yahushua one? Then he changed his name? Like right during like the whole Maccabees? Thing. Oh yeah, well, yeah, that's a whole detailed story in itself. <laughs> All right. So what, so... Be a part of the restoration of all things, there has to be restoring the tabernacle of David, and part of restoring the tabernacle of David is restoring the Zadok priesthood. But how do you restore the Zadok priesthood? Because if anybody walks around and says, "Hello, I'm a Zadok priest," you kind of you should look at them pretty funny, okay? Right. Okay, they can't prove it. Right. So today, all that we're doing today is we're going to lay a foundation. I mean, in our day, in our time. We're going to lay a foundation, but the fullness of it is going to be in the millennium. We're just laying that foundation. And what is that foundation? How do we restore the Zadok priesthood? In my, my viewpoint, there's one and only one, day, one way that we, we restore the Zadok priesthood is re restore the authority of the Zadok priesthood, which we, re which we restore and we follow their calendar. We now say we recognize your authority. And in recognizing your authority, we're going to follow the, the calendar. So I've had some people that have perhaps not had, have heard the story as I'm explaining it now, and they're looking at it like neutrally, on neutral ground. They're going, okay, let me examine this calendar and see how they do this and that and how they do this and that. And you know what? I think if they had that particular way that they're doing it, they're not kind of like, they're not quite doing it quite right. So, you know, I, th I think it should be done this way. So they're trying to adjust the calendar. Okay, now to me that's invalid. And here's the reason why that's invalid. Because of Ezekiel 44. Okay? Ezekiel 44 makes to me that whole process invalid. I am going to accept the calendar as specified in the Dead Sea Scrolls because there were Zadok priests at that time, and that's, they laid out their calendar, and, and, they, and they followed it that way. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to get to, not tonight, but in, 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 a, in another PowerPoint tomorrow, the next day, whatever, is um, I'm sure you are aware uh, that the, the Christian scholars, historians, virtually all of them, and they don't agree on a whole lot, you know. But they virtually all agree that John the Baptist grew up in the, in the wilderness in the Qumran area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if he grew up in the wilderness in the Qumran area with the, uh, with, the, with the Qumran community. Now, the significance of him doing that, I'm going to try to amplify in the next two PowerPoints, which is not tonight. It will be in the next couple days. Um, and, and that is, if he was a part of the community, I'm going to end up showing you what was required to be a part of that, that community. That community, as specified in the Dead Sea Scrolls, is a covenant community. Mm -hmm. 
And you could only be accepted into the community. You could, okay? And when you're accepted into the community, um, you go through a process. They make sure that, you know, you're serious and they watch you for a while and then they ultimately accept you. And then in affirming the acceptance, you get water immersed. But in doing so, that community, as specified multiple places in the Dead Sea Scrolls, was led by the sons of Zadok. They were the leaders, and in order to join the community, you had to make a pledge. I am going to follow the Torah according to the teachings and the following of the sons of Zadok. That pledge had to be made in order for you to be a part of the community. If John the Baptist was a part of that community, he had to um, do that pledge. <laughs> so therefore, John the Baptist grew up following this calendar. Okay? He, he followed the calendar. Now, wait, who's John the Baptist? I was about to say, he's the high priest of that. Well, in he's Luke that. chapter 1, verse 17, it says he's of the spirit and the power of Elijah. In other words, the Elijah ministry, that's John's ministry, the Elijah ministry follows the Zadok calendar. So if the historical uh, Elijah ministry followed the Zadok calendar, wouldn't the restoration um, of the days of Elijah then, as a part of the restoration, follow that calendar? So... Um, I've been to Israel a total of 14 times. Several of those times I was on tour. So I've been to the Qumran, I don't know, three, four times. And this is a little summary of what happens if you've ever been on a tour and go to the Qumran in Israel. So you're, you know, you're there for about a half hour, but you, but you go there and uh, they say, oh, okay, this is uh, where these people lived. And now look over there. They had all these mikvah baths. They, they, was really into, they was really into immersion over here. And by the way, we'll tell you a little bit about them. We're going to show you a, a two-minute film here about some, about their daily life. So they kept, they came and they uh, they did that, this, that, and the other. And then, oh, 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 by the way, um, they also had this belief in the end of days about the uh, the sons of light and the sons of darkness. They believed in this end time battle between the sons of light and the, and the sons of darkness. Okay, uh, 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 go look at the mikvah baths. Uh, we'll, we'll meet over here at the, uh, the, the, the bus over here in, in, in 20 minutes. Okay, we'll see you then. So they tell us about the sons of light and sons of darkness, about this end time battle, but they don't tell us any more. So only by reading the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there is a scroll, the in, scroll. called the War Scroll that describes the sons of light and the sons of darkness, but, but very plainly in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know who were the sons of light? It was the people of the Qumran community. And why did they call themselves the Sons of Light? Because they, they followed this calendar. Who did they call the Sons of Darkness? Uh, the Pharisees. Pharisees. Uh, why? Because they followed the Babylonian calendar. So time was so holy, so important, um, that they believed <clears throat> that there would be an end time religious battle and the judgment of God in the end of days would be over which calendar that you followed. <laughs> you got that background? You see that connection now? With that connection, look how we can see, look how we can see Matthew in chapter 3 um, because just reading the text by itself, you're not going to... You're not going to get what's going on here. So in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, it says, When John, John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism and said to them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Those are strong words. They're like, let's not, you know, while we get along. You know, uh, you know, let's reconcile our differences. Like, you generation of vipers. I mean, how are you going to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, like, why was he so, you know, a big, big time on it? And so, you know, the wrath to come, the wrath to come, that's the end time judgment of God. So he says, now, look, you're not going to escape the end time judgment of God. Well, what are they doing so wrong? Uh, the sons of light, the sons of darkness. They're following the wrong calendar. And he says, you know what? You're going to be judged big time because, because you're following the Babylonian calendar instead of following the priestly calendar. You're rebelling against the high priesthood of God it, just like Korah did. And look what happened to Korah and his gang in the judgment there. How are you going to escape? Because look what you've done. John. You've actually taken over the authority and you're claiming that authority. 
Korah just wanted it. You're actually claiming you have it. How are you going to escape the wrath to come? Okay, so from, uh, from this time on, from Zadok the priest, only the descendants of Zadok were allowed to be high priest. So now this is the Jewish Encyclopedia article on Zadok. It says, Zadok manifested his loyalty uh, to the king when he espoused the cause of Solomon against Adonijah. And in his gratitude, the new king appointed him sole high priest, that's Solomon. In the account of this event, Josephus says, the historian Josephus, that Zadok was a descendant of the house of Phineas and consequently a descendant of Eleazar. Now I'm reading you this article only for this sentence. Reliable, this is Josephus' words, reliable, well it's in the, the Jewish encyclopedia, reliable historical data shows that the high priesthood remained in the hands of the Zadokites from this time until the rise of the Maccabees. <coughs> So now, uh, what we've just outlined, here's another way to see it. In 1 Chronicles 6.3, we're told that Aaron has four sons. And then it, chronic, 1 Chronicles 6.4, going forward, um, tells Eleazar, Phineas, and then the line. And then the line goes to, this is actually Zadok 1. And then we continue in the line. And it goes to um, Zadok 2. Here's Zadok 2. And then ultimately the line goes into where they go into Babylonian captivity. In the days of Jehozadak, they go into Babylonian <coughs> captivity. All right, so th there you can see the chronology of the, of the lineage. Um, but if you want to see it in list form, this is, this is uh, the same thing in 1 Chronicles in list form. You got Zadok 1 after 12 generations. And then you have number 19, Zadok 2. And then ultimately, Jehozadak, they go into Babylonian captivity. All right, so um, the Zadok priest, Jehozadak, goes into Babylonian captivity. And the Zadok priest, Joshua, or Yehoshua, returns from Babylonian captivity. And then we have the rebuilding of the first temple in the days of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. And then we have uh, the return of the exiles that's listed in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, Ezra 2.2, 2, Nehemiah 7.7. 7. And now in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 1, uh, we have the listing of the Zadok priest who came back from Babylonian captivity. And who were the priests until uh, we go through the Persian era, era or, or during the time of the Persian era. era. So um, here we have uh, the priest. Here's the, uh, the first one, Jeshua or Joshua. And then here's the last one, Jadua. All right. So this is during the Persian era. What comes after the Persian era? The Greek, Greek era. era. The Greek era. So uh, Z the, the Zadok priest Jadua, who's that? That's the last one here. Um, According to Josephus, he was a contemporary of Alexander the Great. And so there's six Zadok priests in the Persian era. We count these, you'll have six. And of course, we know the office was handed down to father, to oldest son. And the Zadok priest Joshua um, parallels Zerubbabel. Now Zerubbabel who came up out of Babylon. Now this is Zerah, seed or sown, Babel, Babylon, sown in Babylon. So Zerubbabel was a, a ruler, came back from Babylon, Ezra, Nehemiah. He's from the house of David. And uh, Joshua, Yehoshua, is a Zadok priest. So the two leaders here coming back from Babylonian captivity is from the house of David and a Zadok priest. So uh, Haggai and Zechariah, uh, uh, the biblical books, Haggai and Zechariah, tell about the roles of Joshua and Zerubbabel at that time. And here I want to show with, uh, share with you um, this author uh, speaking about Zechariah 4. And you know that the two lampstands, um, which 
Um, I have always and, and only exclusively identified with Revelation 11 and the two witnesses and that connection. But this author brings out a perspective um, on Zechariah 4 here that I had never heard, that I never considered. That's why I'm going to be sharing this with you. It says, uh, regarding Zechariah 4 and the vision of the two lampstands, a point of similarity between Zechariah 3 and 4 is that the two rulers, a Davidic leader and a high priest, um, uh, is centered around Joshua, while chapter 4 is about Zerubbabel. The central image of the vision is the lampstand and two olive trees that supply it with oil. Uh, the menorah and, and, and these two anointed ones, literally in, in the Hebrew, sons of oil. And he, here's what I'm sharing with you, this thought that I never considered it this way before. That these two sons of oil are representative of the restored priesthood of Zadok and the house of David. I never saw it that way, that they represented the Zadok and the house of David. Okay, I, only, I only said, oh, they're the two witnesses of Revelation 11. All right, so now I've shared you enough that there's somehow this connection that the tribe of Judah gets narrowed down to the house of David. Well, um, um, Aaron and his sons gets narrowed down to Eleazar, and that gets narrowed down to the Zadok priests. So God's chosen line in, in, among the priesthood is Zadok. His chosen line, his kingly line in Judah through, is through the house of David. All right, so that is how... Aaron, who took a wife from the tribe of Judah, that their marriage is prophetic. It's the coming together, the priestly line, in, in, the, in the, the kingly line, the priest in the kingly line. So Messiah is linked with the two chosen families, the house of David and the Zadok priest. So here in Zechariah 6, when they're told to, to, to make crowns and put it on the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, now he is a Zadok priest. So we're going to do... Um, a prophetic act, right? We're going to do a prophetic act, and this prophetic act is being done to a Zadok priest. And and uh, when a, when the crown's being put on the head of the Zadok priest, now the prophecy is given when the crown's put on the Zadok priest. The, there's a prophecy given about the Messiah, mm -hmm. because there's going to be one whose name is the branch. That's the Messiah. Um, he's going to build the temple of the Lord. So now, in Jeremiah 33, 15, it says, I'm going to cause the branch of righteousness to grow up out of David. And it says, David will never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house. So there's a special prophecy that was given to the house of David. But then we know that, but we kind of missed this one. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings. And then it says, Aaron and his sons offered the burnt offerings. So... There will neither shall the priests the Levites offer burnt offerings. So this comes from Aaron and his sons. And then it goes on to say, so this phraseology here about the priests, the Levites, which is a reference to Aaron and his sons, the priests, the Levites. This is a phraseology in Ezekiel 43, 19. The priests, the Levites, that be of the seed of Zadok. Uh, they will approach to minister unto me. So now in Jeremiah chapter 33, he says, I'm going to, I will multiply the seed of David and the Levites that minister to me. And then it says, the two families which I've chosen. Which two families have the Lord chosen? The David. seed of David and the Levites. He's, he's chosen the house of David to bring the King Messiah. He's chosen through the priesthood, the Zadok priests. He's chosen these two families. So we know Romans 1, 3, Yeshua is from the house of David. And, um, uh, but what, I, what wasn't in the forefront of my mind was that Yeshua is, is also among his earthly family, his, his earthly descendants. Um, he's related to the Zadok priesthood. How? He says, yeah, through Mary and his mother. Said Mary to the angel. The angel answered and said, your cousin Elizabeth. So Mary's cousin is Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is the wife of Zecharias, um, who is a priest, and most probably a Zadok priest. So if he's a Zadok priest, if Zechariah is a Zadok priest, then John is a Zadok priest. He was the high priest that mixed with Yahushua. That's right. 
That's why Yeshua said, no, I, it has yeah, to come from you. So when Yeshua was when Yeshua was immersed by John, Yeshua was, it's, it, it, now when we know this background, Yeshua was acknowledging the authority of John through the Zadok priesthood. He was, ignore, he was acknowledging the authority of the Zadok priesthood. Now, Yeshua is not a Zadok priest. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so um, um, Zedek in Hebrew, Zedek means righteousness. righteousness. If I change the vowels from Zedek, I can say Zadok, Zadok. So um, Melchizedek, I, I read it, Melech is king. I, I read that as king of righteousness, but if I change the vowels, I can read it as king of the Zadok priests. Yeshua is the king of the Zadok priests. He's over the Zadok priest. His Melchizedek priesthood is different and distinct from the Zadok priesthood. And his Zadok priesthood is, oh, his Melchizedek priesthood is over the Zadok priesthood. Okay, so, so they're actually all linked together. Yeah, they're subject Ulti to him, ultimately they functionally. Yeah. Yeah. His yeah. Kingdom. So uh, that Melchizedek can be rendered king of the Zadok priests. So now we get into the Grecian era. So uh, uh, the Grecian era starts around 323 BC. Um, and Josephus is our primary historical source regarding the high priests of the Grecian era. Okay? So uh, mainly using Josephus, um, the line comes down this way. Now there's, there's technical things that are going on as we get down to Onius and Simeon II and, and whatnot, but ultimately um, the Zadok, uh, this is a part of the Zadok line and, and the Zadok line you know, ends as we get down um, into these details. And then uh, beginning with Jason, um, there started to be um, a, a departure from how things had been for years and starting with Jason is, you notice he was from 175 to 172. That's where the Greek corruption begins to come in and the, and the, and the influence in the high priesthood. So ultimately from the, from the Greek uh, uh, influence, given that the Greeks wanted to impose their way of life, so um, the Greeks began to appoint the high priests. And so here it says the high... The high priest of Jason and Menelaus both achieved their position through bribes to the Seleucid king. Paid positions. So um, the ending of Zadok priest being the priest um, happened during uh, the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now Antiochus Epiphanes IV is the figure when we uh, talk about Hanukkah and what went on in Hanukkah um, and come and sacri uh, it sacrifices a pig and puts a statue of Zeus and this causes the, the big rebellion. So we're told about that part of the story that Antiochus Epiphanes did. But you know in Daniel it says there's going to be one that's going to change times and seasons. You know who was initially, who initially did that? You know the popes did it and whatnot. But you know who initially did it? Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He changed times and seasons. So, you know, ultimately what he did in changing times and seasons? He changed the calendar. Now, I'm going to get into this in detail when we go over the calendar, and that's the largest and longest presentation. But uh, um, here's the history of the calendar. The calendar that, uh, that Israel was following in Egypt from Pharaoh, uh, which may have been called an Egyptian calendar, that calendar was followed in Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And in, in Babylon, it's called the Babylonian calendar. The Persians picked it up. And then after the Persians, Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, he picked it up. And, and then that was picked up by the Greek Seleucids and Antiochus IV. So what would be called the Greek calendar of Antiochus IV, which he tries to impose upon Jerusalem in the temple system, um, uh, is the same as the Babylonian calendar. 
So the, this part of what Antiochus did to impose the calendar is not told in Judaism. They leave that part out of the story because it would incriminate them because they're following that same calendar. So uh, uh, in the process of time, Jonathan is the first uh, Maccabean priest and he was appointed by the Greeks and he began what's called the Hasmonean period. The, the Hasmonean or Maccabean, uh, they were high priests for 110 years where they had a family uh, dispute of succession and uh, ultimately that resulted in a civil war and that's how the Romans came and that's how Herod took over in 37 uh, BC. But uh, these Maccabean priests weren't Zadok priests. So them being the high priest was a form of usurping the high priesthood. Mm -hmm. And so this is where um, who Yah designated to be the high priest started uh, to not be. So Jonathan was the first Maccabean priest and he was appointed high priest by the Greeks. And the, the Hasmoneans were high priests for about 110 years, 152 to 37 BC. And uh, Jonathan's appointment by the Greeks ended the Zadok priesthood in the temple. And so what, what, is, what happens, what's the reaction of the Zadok priests? They well, flee. they flee and they ultimately establish a community in the Qumran and, and ultimately the leadership of that community are Zadok priests. They take the temple library with them and they also take the, the preserving of the calendar. So they go to the Qumran and um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it explains how the Qumran community started in a document of the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Damascus document. And uh, this is actually the English from the scrolls, from this book, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It says, in the era of wrath, 390 years at the time that he handed them over to the power of Nebuchadnezzar, from Aaron, a root of planning to inherit the land, we were for a period of time like the blind, groping for our way. Um, uh, so he raised up to them a teacher of righteousness to guide them. If one reads the numbers literally as given in the scrolls, according to the chronology, uh, the 390 years would have extended from 587 when Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem to 197, and, and then they groped like blind men for 20 years. So this dating takes us to about 177. And this is around the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, when, when all these things happen. So the Dead Sea Scrolls say explicitly that the leadership in the, com uh, in the Qumran community were Zadok priests. It is quite clear from the Qumran literature at our disposal that the leadership of the community consisted of priests who traced their lineage to the house of Zadok and thereby to the high priesthood. So this is a couple places in the scrolls themselves that mention the leadership of the Zadok priest. So he built them a faithful house in Israel, and God prom as God promised them by Ezekiel, the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok. So in the Qumran community, they saw Ezekiel <coughs> chapter 44 as talking about them. And here it says, uh, this is from the, the scrolls, whoever approaches the council of the community... He shall undertake by a binding oath to return with all of his heart and soul to every commandment of the Torah in accordance to what's been revealed to it by the sons of Zadok, the priests, the keepers of the covenant and the seekers of his will. Another example from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The sons of Zadok are the elect of Israel, the men called by name. And furthermore, the sons of, the sons of Levite shall hold office each in his place under the authority of the sons of Aaron, under the authority of the sons of Zadok the priests. So there was actually a blessing for the Zadok priests in the scrolls, the words of blessing belonging to the instructor to which to bless the sons of Zadok the priests, saying, 
So the fact that, that the Zadok priests were the leadership in the Qumran community is undeniable because it's explicitly stated in the scrolls. And so um, the, the leader of their community was called the teacher of righteousness. So the title has, can have multiple meanings. Number one, the Torah is called righteousness. So he's the teacher of the Torah. But the teacher of righteousness is also a title for the Messiah in Joel chapter 2. So um, he's the teacher of the Torah and he's to be revered, revered like the Messiah would be revered. And so in this, uh, this part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it details a conflict between who's called in the scrolls the wicked priest and the teacher of righteousness. And this term wicked priest appears about seven times in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And according to people that's examined uh, all the information going on, and this is not um, uh, absolutely agreed upon, but by and large, uh, the, 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 the greatest belief is that Jonathan is the leading candidate for the wicked priest that's being referred to in the scrolls. So now... Um, the very first early Jewish believers uh, in Yeshua, as recorded in the book of Acts from Acts chapter 2, what was their, what was their initial name? The Yahudim. They were called Nazarenes, and they were called the Way. So wh where, why were they called Nazarenes? From Nazarene, the root of that, we got the Hebrew word Netzar, which means branch. So um, here we got the Qumran community, and do you think 100% of the Qumran community believed in Yeshua as the Messiah? 100%? No. No. I mean, maybe 99%, yeah. but like 100%? Yeah. No. So, so, so what do we call the portion of them that became believers as contrast to those that maybe didn't? Well, they're, they're just a branch. We call them a sect. They're the branch of that community that happens to believe in the Messiah. They're a branch. So we just called them branches. <laughs> we called them branches or we called them Nazarenes. Uh, so, but, why, but why were they also called the way? Because if you read in, the, in their documents, when they look for a, a direction, they found what they should do regarding their situation, the temple being corrupted. They, fought, they saw the direction in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. A voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, if you read in Hebrew the word wilderness, it's Arava. That is a specific place in Israel. So they actually went to the region of the Arava. And so their community got established based upon that verse, Isaiah 40, verse 3. And that verse says, uh, uh, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So they were, because that's they were founded on that, they were called the people of the way. And what, what were they preparing themselves for? They were preparing themselves there for the coming of the Messiah. And what does it say in the New Testament about John the Baptist in, John, in Matthew chapter 3? He's the one of the one crying in the wilderness. The verse by which this community um, um, started and established itself. So now, with this background, with this background, we're told in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. This is not very far from Acts chapter 2. Paul hasn't even come to faith yet in Acts chapter 9. And here's what it says. That the word of Yah increased, and it says, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Not just one or two, not just a couple. A great number of the priests. Well, who are these priests that became believers in Yeshua? The, are they Pharisees? Mm -hmm. Are they Sadducees? Nope. Well, what are the priests are there? Zadok. They're Zadok priests. So the Zadok priests became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. And so what I'm going to show you, not tonight, but in another PowerPoint, is what was the beliefs of the Qumran community? Because then who were the very first... Jewish believers, not exclusively, but, uh, but uh, primarily, they were those of and connected to that community. 
There were some Pharisee believers, but most of them were of and from that community. So what belief system do you think those very first Jewish believers had in Yeshua? It was the belief system that they brought from the Qumran community. So the Qumran community belief system became the very first belief system of the very first believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. And where did that uh, start out from that belief system where did it start out from Jerusalem Acts chapter 2 Jerusalem so in Jerusalem in the beginning it was pure but as it left Jerusalem and it went out and left the land of Israel when it went out in the nations when it went out into Greece and Rome what was in Jerusalem in the beginning gets corrupted and we today identify with Greco-Roman Christianity the corruption and it's in it's in the Greco-Roman Christianity where the present day doctrine of Christianity that everyone identifies thinks and thinks as New Testament, Biblical and Paul, the doctrine of dispensationalism. They brought the doctrine of dispensationalism. It wasn't with the very first Jewish believers. So um, I made this statement. I got to speak at the annual Hebraic Roots meeting called uh, Revive in Nashville last year. And I made this uh, statement there because in the movement over the years, there's been an emphasis about going back to the beginning. And so I said, um, uh, this, the statement I'm making, I'm going to make now is a very Hebraic statement, okay? So I, I made this statement. I said, this movement in going back to the beginning has not gone back to the beginning. Now, the only way, only Hebraically can you say you've gone back to the beginning but haven't gone back to the beginning. So, have we gone back to the beginning in the movement? The answer is yes. We've gone back to Genesis. We've looked at the garden. We've, we've, we've looked at how the beginning tells about the end. We have gone back to the beginning. But in going back to the beginning, we haven't gone back to the beginning. We haven't gone back to the beginning of first faith in Yeshua and study who were these Jewish believers. The Zadok priests were obedient to the, to the faith. And so now, um, I'm not going to go into big detail about this now. I'm just going to throw it out, okay? But in Acts chapter 2, it says these words. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Do you need that word fully? Why is that word fully in there? Why can't you just say when the day of Pentecost had come? Why does it say when it had fully come? If there's just one Pentecost that you keep, why do you say that it's fully come? Well, um, we had the Pharisees that followed their calendar, and when did they start counting? No, the, the Pharisees start counting the, the counting the Omer oh, in the middle of matzah. The, yeah, they start counting it after uh, uh, after the, the after their high day, Sunday. after the first day of unleavened bread. Okay, when on did the sixteenth? When did the Pharisees? When did the when did the Sadducees count? Start counting the Omer after the Sabbath during the week of unleavened bread. So if I start counting the Omer by the Pharisees, who's going to come to? Uh, Shavuot first. Mm. The Pharisees, because they start counting first. Mm. Then the Sadducees, they count starting the, the morrow after the week uh, during unleavened bread. So their Shavuot is going to be a little bit later than the Pharisees. But I, we haven't gone in the calendar, but if, say if you already know something about the calendar. <laughs> they start counting the next week. So who's going to celebrate Shavuot last among the three? Mm -hmm. It would be the Qumran community. And so it says when it had fully, fully come. I believe this is a little hint that it's referring to the, the Pentecost of the Qumran community and what they were celebrating. Because something that I never thought about and thought through was, we just repeat what we hear. We say, there was this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, was there a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. So why did I say we say that there's this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Because... Um, uh, do you know there's a person in you know my generation? His name was Billy Graham, mm -hmm. and and he would fill stadiums, and he filled stadiums in America, and he filled stadiums in, in Russia, and when he filled those stadiums, how many's in a stadium? Eighty thousand. Yeah, yeah. How many people came down? More than three thousand. A lot. Probably more than three thousand. Yeah. Billy Graham does better at a revival in America than what we did in the Book of Acts, and we call this a great outpouring. <laughs> Okay, but I'm not going to mock it. This is a great outpouring. Mm -hmm. But what I'm, what I'm really telling the story that way to, to, to highlight a point for you that there were 3,000 saved. Now, you know what the Torah says? All the males are supposed to come to Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. So 
we're, we're keeping the commandment. So how many males should be in Jerusalem for Shavuot? Thousands. 200,000, 500,000, a million. Yeah. So let's say we have 500,000 that's in Jerusalem. And we have this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. There's 500,000 people there. And 3,000 3, get yeah. saved. Come on now. That ain't no big, <laughs> that ain't no big revival. That preacher wasn't preaching. Was but, but if a minority of the people were keeping the third Pentecost, if the minority of the people were, were keeping uh, the, the, the Zadok calendar and that Shabbat, most of all the other people that kept it, they weren't there. They were all home. So we just have a little small number, like when we have our gathering here, we just have a little full number. And there, was there 3,000 saved? Was that a large number for the people that was there? I'm going to say that it was. Okay, but here's another point about that is, this, to me, this is just not a peripheral issue. It's like, oh, you know, I doctrinally believe that. What do you doctrinally believe? Oh, I got it. Okay, look, I do more than you. <laughs> this, isn't, uh, this is a very serious thing because you know what? If you kept the wrong Shabbat, you missed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The calendar that you followed was important and significant, or else you missed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, I teach coming on the end of days, there's going to be an exodus back to the land. And I teach that that exodus is going to start at Passover. Well, what if it's this year when we have the, the Jewish Passover one month later than the, the Zadok uh, Passover? And, uh, you know, uh, what if you're going to wait to the Jewish Passover and go to the Exodus, but, but actually the Exodus starts with the Zadok Passover, and, and you, the camp's already there, and the cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night's moving, and maybe, I don't know, let, let God be merciful, but maybe, are you going to be able to get in or not if you're doing the wrong calendar? I don't know. We'll, we'll wait and find out. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. All right, so, now to amplify what I did at the beginning... The God of Israel has chosen and appointed the sons of Zadok to be the priests, as it says in Ezekiel 44, 15, the priests, the sons of Zadok. Uh, and then it, he also clarifies it. It's going to be those that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok. All right. And then here, it's, he has this is prophecy about the sons of Zadok. And basically, like I said at the beginning, I've said everything that I've said so far in this presentation only to amplify and highlight, in my mind at least, the significance of this verse that Yah has made a declaration. Yah has made a ruling that in controversy, they, the sons of Zadok, they will stand in judgment and they will judge it. So historically, there was a controversy. And so who apparently did, Yah, did Yeshua stand with? Did John the Baptist stand with? Um, this is another issue. I'm not going to elaborate on it. But um, I, had, I have since learned that when Yeshua had his last supper, it, it, was, it was in the uh, Essene quarter of Jerusalem. And when they were waiting in Acts, in Acts chapter 1 here for the day of Pentecost, they were waiting. Where were they waiting? They were waiting in the Essene quarter of Jerusalem. Why, why, why in the Essene quarter of Jerusalem? Okay, so there's, there's something being taught to them there um, um, by Yeshua. And so... Like I said, this verse that he said in controversy, they will stand in judgment, it's referring back to this verse, Deuteronomy 17, that regarding matters of controversy within your gates, you will go to the priests, the Levites, to the judge in those days. And this is important because one of the strong claims that's being made today by why we need to follow the, I'm going to call it the Babylonian calendar, why we should follow the Babylonian calendar is because um, the Sanhedrin are your Torah authority. And if you say you're following the Torah, you need to follow the Sanhedrin because they were given the authority by God in the Torah. But, uh, but they claim that authority came from there. But we have an interpretation of that verse in our Bible. And Yah said, it's the sons of Zadok. Okay, and so now... Uh, besides Ezekiel 44, we have one other place in the Bible where Deuteronomy 17 is made a reference to. And that is here by Jehoshaphat. And King Jehoshaphat, um, he set up Levites and priests. Now look, now how did, how did Jehoshaphat uh, understand Deuteronomy 17 verse 8? Well, he understood that it meant the Levites and the priests. So he set up the Levites and the priests for matters of controversy. But what does Deuteronomy 17 verse 8 says? Who's supposed to be matters of controversy? 
the priests the Levites. So he did exactly what it said. <coughs> so it didn't say he set up the Sanhedrin. He set up the priests and the Levites. And so um, they're, they're, they're to be the teachers of the Torah. And so I said all that. Woo! I said all that to say this. Oh, over here I can click on this. That was the last slide there. Oh, no. Who's that young fellow? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good to me. Now, I could just verbally say it, but we'll go to the last slide here if it'll let me to. Is that, here we go, is that in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, it talks about there's going to be a restoration of all things. I'd like to submit to you that the restoring of the Zadok priesthood and thus the restoration of the Zadok priesthood calendar is a part of the restoration of all things because the restoration of all things not only refers to what Adam sold out on in the garden, but there is a restoring the tabernacle of David. And while we have, we have restored some things in this movement, there's some in this movement who's been here for a while that says, you know what? Um, I think we've arrived. We don't need to do anymore. We just need to do this tour stuff until, Masuk, until Yeshua comes because we got it right. And you say, saying, uh, you know what? I have more for you. Do you want it or not? And, and this is the next level of what he's revealing and showing. And so now in saying all this, while I tried to amplify it so you will connect and identify uh, with the issue and the seriousness of this issue, I also want to make this statement. And it is, um, I'm primarily emphasizing in this uh, teaching, authority. Okay? And I myself have personally benefited, and I've, my, my understanding of the Bible, and even the New Testament, and even the teachings of Yeshua, has been greatly enriched by studying the perspective of the rabbis regarding different elements and understandings of scripture and and I, I have a big debt of gratitude in in uh, in the rabbis through the, through the ruach um, of, of the Lord that directed me uh, to, to help to help me understand the scriptures through their understanding rather than the church fathers and so um, we should not throw the rabbis in a basket and what they're able to give and what we can glean from us and say, uh, 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 you know, just because they may have missed it in one area, we throw everything out. Just like in the church world, they may have missed some things, but you don't throw everything out. Okay, so appreciate what's been given by the rabbis, just like you're going to appreciate what's been given in the church. The church did teach us Yeshua was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The church did teach us that we're saved by grace through faith. They did teach us about he shed his blood and the importance of shedding his blood. So let's not dismiss that, just like we don't dismiss with the rabbis. So while we appreciate what the rabbis have given us, at the same time, in balance, um, I believe we should... Uh, uh, Embrace the truth that Yah is showing us in this particular restoration. And, and as Paul warned us in Romans chapter 11, um, if, if we're going to embrace this, because there was a time we were celebrating Christmas and Easter, right? So like, who are we to say, okay, we're, we're the smarties. We were celebrating Christmas and Easter. Now all of a sudden, we come to the festivals and we're wondering around what we do. And then, then, then we find out, oh, we're, they're doing a Babylonian calendar. Uh, we need to we need to follow the Zadok priestly calendar. Don't do what Paul said in Romans 11 and, and get high-minded against the root. Don't get high-minded against the Jewish people. Don't get high-minded against the rabbis. Don't get high-minded about, oh, you know what? Um, I'm better than you because, you know, I'm doing it right and, and the Jews are doing it wrong because they're doing the <coughs> Babylonian calendar, okay? Still show love and appreciation and servanthood to your brother while going forward in the truth of God. Okay. Part of their blindness. Yeah, so um, this is uh, the first of four PowerPoints I have to show. 
And this PowerPoint was meant to lay a foundation for the calendar because if you don't have an appreciation for the high priesthood, its history, uh, the Zadok priest, um, and uh, Ezekiel 44, um, uh, I believe this is your foundation to really then connect to the calendar that you're not going to connect to the calendar as strongly if you don't have this foundation. That's why I've given this presentation tonight as a foundation for us to then go into and look at the calendar in its detail, which will be done on the fourth PowerPoint. So anybody have any uh, questions, comments, thoughts? Because that concludes my spiel for today. I've got one. Is it... <laughs> From my reading and studies, if you join the uh, the Qumran community, it took three years. Yeah, two to three years, yeah. Paul spent three years there. Yeah. And he made the statement that the sect that is called the way, that's the way I follow. And he was on his way to Damascus. That's, yeah. that's right. So he followed, he followed the way. Right. He did. He testified that in, uh, before King far. Agrippa. Yeah. Exactly right. Well, I really appreciate everything you have shared very much. So get into the point. Did I kind of understand in my mind correctly, after listening to this, that it's very possible or even likely that Yehoshua HaMashiach himself kept this ADOT calendar? Yes. Correct? Yes. Are we 100% convinced that he did? Well, his character is not the final battle. That's all I need to say. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to ask is something that we were discussing back there in Sukkot. In your opinion, was Ezra a priest under the order of Zadok? Um, I, I believe it's my understanding, yes. Okay, then... He was up, he was up the line of Eleazar. All right. That's what, that's what I really mean to say. He's up the line of Eleazar. So was it out of fear or out of lack of knowledge mm -hmm. that how chapter 8 in Nehemiah reads out where they hadn't really kept the Feast of Tabernacles since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. Yeah, you know, Israel has that history. Well, they, well, they do the Torah, and then they, then they back away from the Torah. Yeah. Well, that's my point. Is, like, is that you read all the prophecy, and you read what Messiah said, and it's all about back to the line of David, but if they hadn't kept it since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, in my opinion, that means... David well, and Solomon well, never even knew what the Feast of Tabernacles no, was. No, uh, you know, uh, David's dedication of the temple was during the time of the, the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so there was a period of time where they didn't do it, but it didn't go all the way back that far. You said Ezra chapter 8? Yeah. You remember the verse? Or the it's the very end of it. Okay. <clears throat> Nehemiah 8. I, th I think it's referring so, to they had never kept it in the way that they kept it at the magnitude. I, I believe I, I, I agree with that too. <laughs> yeah. So there's, like you said, like you said, there's way you can look at it. It doesn't mean they didn't celebrate it at all. Yeah. It means they didn't celebrate with this particular understanding or in this particular way. Yeah. I'm, I'm just doing these particular things. That's just where I'm trying to combine the two. Where you, you would think that. A priest that had been taught in the ways of the Zadok would know before they once again found the scrolls. Well, you know, you, we, we got the recording of the kings, you know, uh, yeah. uh, <coughs> the restoration, keeping Passover and whatnot. And so they kept the feasts. Well, I, I, there was, there was a, a, actually, actually, it says about Jeroboam, it says that he kept the feast of the, uh, of this, uh, of the, of the seventh month and the eighth month, like the Feast of <clears throat> Judah, implying that Judah was doing the seventh month while the northern kingdom was doing the Feast of Tabernacles in the eighth month. So that verse is indicating that, they, that the northern kingdom was doing the Feast of Tabernacles <clears throat> just at the wrong time. Well, do you believe that some of them were, like, that actually believed in their certain tribe were keeping it the ways as described in the Book of Jubilees that they were keeping it for the first reason that they were given? <clears throat> well... The principle is, uh, you know, I think Paul said that there was always a remnant in each generation that believed in Yeshua. So you carry that same principle. There's always going to be a remnant that's keeping it. 
but usually when you say whether they keep it or not, you render it according to the majority, even though you could have a minority that still are. There's going to be people who ask questions. Are there any questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah. So my uh, question is because uh, my interpretation of what you said is it's very this counter is quite important. You talking about you related to the the rod of Aaron in the in the ark, right? Yeah. And so my question is why did Yeshua when he was correcting the Pharisees and that sort of thing? Why did he never? He, it was usually in the Torah. He never really corrected them on the calendar. From my recollection, he never talked about the calendar. And so why, if it's that important, and I'm not doubting you, so, but I'm just, it's just an honest question. Why did he not talk about it? Well, here's the thing. John said at the end of John chapter 21, mm -hmm. if all the things he did was written down, the books couldn't hold them. So what we have is a particular narrative that whoever authored Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, chose to share. Uh, but if... if uh, but but if, weren't if those you, the miracles you, that he was talking about? If you go to... Um, if you go to uh, Luke chapter 1, um, yeah. uh, we see that this was written to uh, the most excellent... The, the Pilus. Mm -hmm. So, in the, in, the, in the direct thing, this was only written to one person. Okay, so there's things going on that doesn't need to get explained to him. So what is being explained to him is basically how Yeshua fulfills the prophecy where he has a, a, a missing link and a connection. So would have he have known uh, that, that these issues um, were and were going on and there was conflict? He didn't need to be told that. Right. No, I am the uh, the story makes a lot of sense to me what you're saying, but I, that's just the, the question that came to mind as, as this whole discussion was going on. Well, if, why did he not bring it up? Well, he did actually, and it was okay. what I read to you yesterday, Whoa. the first five verses of Matthew 16. You adulterous generation, you know how to tell the weather, but you uh, forget about the okay. times. So you got to remember, as, as we somehow sometimes explain it, yeah. as we sometimes explain it, uh, there's four levels of Torah. We have the, the Peshat, the literal, and then the, and the Hint, the Sod, and the, the Darash, and uh, uh, the Rambaz, the, the Darash, and, and the Sod. And so we got to look at what's being said and taught at all four of those levels. Okay, so uh, when Yeshua when 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 Yeshua uh, uh, said uh, to them, "Follow me," okay, if he says "Follow me," we have to assume in there he's following the Torah, right? And so, if we assume he's following the Torah, we also have to assume that he's not following the ways of Babylon, right? Correct. Okay, so if if so in that, it's implied that he's already following the calendar if uh, the Pharisees are following the Babylonian calendar. And actually, what you just said uh, uh, caused me to uh, think of this other uh, thought that uh, Yeshua, I think you did mention here in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, um, he did specifically um, um, did... Uh, two miracle feedings of the loaves and the fishes. Uh -huh. And in doing so, um, he asked them, um, uh, do, you, uh, do you know the difference between the two? And they basically said no. In Matthew 69, it says, do you, do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and the 5,000, how, how many you took up, neither the seven loaves and the 4,000, how many baskets you took up? So, uh, in another version, it ends there, but Matthews goes on mm -hmm. to see what, the, 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 what he was telling them about. Mm -hmm. He says, how is it you do not understand? I speak to you not concerning um, physical bread, but you should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Mm -hmm. So he was warned, don't be aware of the leaven, or in other words, the incorrect ways of following the Pharisees. Okay, so one of the way if, if he that's a general that's a general um, thing that he's telling them about. Well, if one of the things that the Pharisees are doing is following the wrong calendar, right there 
he's actually referring to the calendar. Well, he was talking to the disciples there after they'd done left. What I told him before was chapter verse four or five. Yeah. Where he was telling them how they wanted to see a sign, another sign. What What I'm saying is, yeah. is there's different levels by which you can look to, to, to see something. And we mm. usually try to look at the direct way. We're right. looking for the direct way. Just like, just like, is there a verse, and this is one of the arguments of Orthodox Judaism, by the way, and people like the anti-missionaries like Tovia Singer, is there a verse in the whole Hebrew scriptures that said the Messiah is going to die and be resurrected, and after three days he's going to be resurrected? Is there a direct verse that says that? Mm -hmm. No, but, then he, but on the road to Emmaus, he rebukes his disciples. How is it that you didn't know this? And then they said, show us a sign. He says, the only show sign I'm going to give you is Jonah. So now if I would say to you, um, here, let me read you the story of Jonah. He was in the whale for whatever. I said, see there? Uh, Messiah is going to be resurrected in, you know, in three days. Well, where does it say that at? Well, how come he didn't, how come he didn't say it? If he, if the, how come he didn't say it? Well, in that same way is how, he, how we see the addressing the counter. So if he goes to John the Baptist and he didn't go to, to get immersed in, in the temple in Jerusalem, well, that's a message that's being said there. The leaven of the Pharisees, that's being said there. Yeah. So uh, we can see it in, in those kind of ways. Go and ahead. you can see it in uh, Matthew 26, verse 18, when he uh, had his Passover, right? So he had his Passover on Passover night, right? He wouldn't have did it on a different day, but he wasn't crucified that day, right? He was crucified the next day. So really, on the calendar he was following, he was crucified on the first day of Unleavened Bread, the right. first day of Matzah. But on the Jewish calendar, it was on their Passover, because that's why they were like, we need to get him down because it's Passover. So did he have his Passover a day early, or was he on a different calendar? A different calendar. So that's, that's another thing. When, once we get into the deep, deeper elements of the, the calendar, of course, you obviously looked into it and, and different things. But... Um, um, there's, there's those that uh, analyze Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And why is Matthew, Mark, and Luke called the Synoptic Gospels and John's not called the Synoptic Gospel? Is because um, the, the, the narrative of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John seems to be a little bit different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke seems to be a little bit different than John. Where John's always says it's a Jews calendar. Yeah, so actually, <laughs> when they examine it with the knowledge of, the, of, of this calendar, that it, it, uh, the conclusion by some um, is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke is referring to the Zadok calendar on the events, but John is referring to the Pharisaic calendar when he's specifying the events, and that's why they don't right. blend. Mm -hmm. They'll even say, because some people say, well, they'll you know, come into this understanding that we know that these aren't the feast of the Jews, right? These are Yahuwah's feast. Right. But people will try to insert that into John. They're like, see, John didn't really mean the feast of the Jews. Yes, he did. <laughs> John really meant that, right? Feast of the Pharisees. Yeah. Yeah. He's talking about their calendar, right? Yeah, he's referring to the Pharisees. Right. So here's an, here's an interesting thought. I guess everybody probably have thought about it, but if, if John was the leader and the Zadok priest in Qumran, or Bethabara, was a, is a scripture name for it. Or at least was in line to be, if yeah. he wasn't. So, but, but he was there in that community, and possibly the, the Qumran uh, scrolls and stuff could actually be his Bible that he used, maybe. Um, but what I'm getting at is, Yeshua's first two disciples was Came John's down, disciples. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yep. So they could have actually been in the line of the Zadok priests. I don't know. I mean, it's a possibility. And what you see in, uh, mistake me if I'm wrong, isn't in the, um, the community documents where it's the, the Messiah that they were looking for, the Messiah that they were looking for in the Qumran community it had certain signs what he would do. Yes. And when John the Baptist was in prison, yeah, uh, Yahushua was asking how he was doing, and the guy said, well, what should I tell him? He said, tell him these things. I'm going to go over that the next two minutes. Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, 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 it's not your... <laughs> well, and that's, those are the signs that he gave him. Like, I'll heal the sick, I'll give sight to the blind. Those are all the things that were matching exactly what they were looking for. But I think Moses has some. So, uh, like you said, uh, we have, apparently... Um, some of the disciples of Yeshua that had connection to that community, so we can look at it the other way. 
did Yeshua ever rebuke his disciples for following that calendar? When they were brought up following that calendar? Did they ever either say, no, you're doing this wrong? We don't have a recording of that either. We have uh, questions here. I'm, I'm reading it here. Uh, it says, Luke 1, 5 through 6 says that John's parents were blameless in the sight of Yah. Yeah. Zechariah, John's father, was under Mattathias, who kept the calendar in the temple at the time. Mm -hmm. so, um, is that an assumption? Uh, I'm just reading it. Um, I think that's probably an assumption. Okay. Um, uh, uh, because um, uh, we're, we're not explicitly told um, we're not explicitly told what he's doing or what he's not doing. Um, but because Zacharias is of the <laughs> Zadok line, um, um, in all likelihood, he's uh, and, and, and lived and was of the Qumran community, he's going to keep that calendar. Like I said, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you could not be a member of their community unless you followed that calendar because you, you had to... It's not like us where we can get out here and, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't think you're right, so I'm going to do it this way. They were a community that, that had to follow uh, the rules of the community. And the rules of the community was the Zadok priests are the leaders, and this is the calendar that we follow. So there wasn't any deviation within the community. So any association with the community, follow the calendar. Okay. They made a covenant. Exactly. They what? They made a they covenant. Made a covenant. The other question that is here is, is it possible that the Babylonian months were just a way of adding names to the months instead of numbers? Can you please read 1 Kings 6, 37 through 38, which give two Canaanite months to reconcile the time of year, and it is never spoken of in an ill manner? Okay, yeah, actually in the Torah it says the name of... of, of uh, Foreign God shall not be on your lips. Okay, so um, even even today, uh, the way you uh, uh, the days of the week is in Israel, it's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Okay, and and so that is why you will see predominantly uh, in the scriptures it will say it came to pass on the even in the Torah. Says came back on the in the second month and whatever they they don't have names, okay. So um, actually, while we may have questions and we all we all have to uh, when we're taught something a particular way and something else is presented and we think we should be doing it a particular way, we all, including myself, we all have to go through a reconciliation process, okay. But um, and from my perspective. Um, uh, sometimes we make this, it's extremely simple, and we try to make something extremely simple complicated. So what is extremely simple? It is that um, this is a Babylonian calendar. Uh, don't believe it? Go, go, uh, go and look up wherever you want to do an encyclopedia, go on the internet or whatnot, and don't look at anything religious. Just only look up the historical Babylonian calendar, what it was, independent of any faith or religion or anything, and see what it tells you, see what it describes, and, and see what's happening now. So, number one, I mean, it's, it's, it's a slam dunk, okay? It's not even, it's not even an issue of, of, of dispute. That, that just is... By definition, the Babylonian calendar. Okay, then you ask yourself, then you ask yourself, is it the character and the nature of the God of Israel to tell his people to follow the ways of Babylon? We have in Revelation 18, come out of Babylon unless you partake, partake of her plagues. And then what is, if you really think about what's the Torah all about? Step back. What is the lesson we get in the, in the garden? We have the tree uh, of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so what's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's mixing good and evil. So one of the first lessons that you're taught in the garden is don't mix. So um, why is it that you think that, it's, that you shouldn't eat pig? Okay, because you're not supposed to mix. Okay, why is it that you think that you're not supposed to keep Christmas and Easter? Why? 
It's got some good things. Oh, okay, let's celebrate in the heart of Christ's birthday or whatever. <laughs> okay? But why do you think you should be doing Sabbath and festivals instead of that? Uh, because don't mix. Okay? So it's not the character. <coughs> Everything of the Torah is all about don't mix. It's commandments about don't mix. Don't take after the ways of the nations. So just... Fundamentally, all this study of Torah that you do, one of the things you're supposed to learn is, I think I'm not supposed to mix. And so, ask yourself, Babylonian calendar in the Lord's sacred appointed times, this is an appointed time, that you really think it's his character to mix a Babylonian calendar? That, you, that, that Yeshua followed a Babylonian calendar, that in the millennium, when we all go to Jerusalem, he's going to say, let's follow the Babylonian calendar. <coughs> Out of the sect of the Pharisees. So the, the Zadok <clears throat> priests did not keep this calendar, and so the, the Pharisees did. So the question really should be, why do you think that the sect of the Pharisees are right and the Zadok priests are wrong? And when Yeshua teaches the Torah at all nations in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, and they come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, is he going to say, let's, let's keep uh, uh, Tishrei, let, let's keep the Babylonian calendar and the Babylonian month names? No, what does it say in Hosea? He says he's going to remove the names of Baal out of your lips. These are, these are part that's, of the names of Baal. Can I piggyback on you right there? Because yeah. that's a perfect, that's a perfect no uh, note. So, yeah, no pig. Yeah. But we're not going to eat them. We're just going we're, we're to clean up some stuff. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> hey, the, the pigs clean up some stuff. But um, to your point on uh, 1 Kings 6.38, if you go to um, the Breton Septuagint, so you can look it up in, uh, you have the KJV, I think that is, that you were reading? Yeah. Okay, so um, 1 Kings 6.38. But when I looked at it in the KJV, it wasn't as bad until I went into the, the um, Breton Septuagint. And it says, in the 11th month, in the month of Baal. You just said, don't mix. And that's, that's what it says here. What does it say in yours? <clears throat> Bull, B-U-L. Yeah, see, it's Baal here. So We can look at the Hebrew and see what it says Baal. It probably yeah. does. It says, actually, says, here, I got it for you. But see, um, uh, and, and part of me reading the 15, 18 books on the, on, on the calendar or whatnot, go, go do a study of people that get doctorate degrees for just doing a paper on calendars, okay? Paper on biblical calendars. Here's what they're, 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 they'll tell you, is there's a reference to multiple calendars in, in the Bible. And this, this Ziv and, and Aviv and whatever, these are, these are Canaanite month names. So there's a reference to the Canaanite month names. Then there's a reference to the priestly names, meaning month one, two, three, four, five. And then there's a, there's a reference to Babylonian month names. So let's say that God has said, I want you to uh, write a holy book about the generation that you lived in before the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so he, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, um, I was born in November. Now, why am I going to say I was born in November? Because that's what I know. Okay, so I'm going to use that's what I know. Just like in Ezra and Nehemiah, they're referring to the Babylonian month names because that's what they know and that, that's what they use. It doesn't mean that they're, that they're referring to, um, you know, the biblical months. And, and you also just got to remember who is, you know, who is translating these. They can put their words in because it says the first month. They're going to say, okay, month one in Canaan night, you know, calendar was this. And they can insert those. So yeah. do we find them in the original manuscripts that they had the actual names? So um, it's like, to me, it's like, wait a second. Just this is a Babylonian calendar. So. One of the ways, one of the reasons for you to study the Bible and study the scriptures and study the Torah, I don't know if you ever thought about what the purpose is, but the purpose is, is to know Yah, to know his character. So to know is, um, if I show you something out there, is that according to his character? Now here's what we do today in modern, we, we're, we wear this thing, so what would Yeshua do? And we're saying, what's his character? Okay, so uh, what is the, we learn Torah to know the character of the God of Israel. Okay, is his character to mix? No. No, so therefore if this is mixing, it's, it's a, a violation of his character in principle. 
Now, I can try to reconcile. Now, I mean, uh, if you say, okay, I'm going to accept that as being true. Now, you could say, well, how do I reconcile this? Because there was a day when I realized I should be keeping the, the, the Torah. See, I grew up, probably like you grew up, you know, when I was five, the time I was 18, living at home. Every day we had bacon and eggs, okay? Okay, you didn't ask, but you had breakfast. You just had bacon and eggs. And so it wasn't until... It wasn't until my eyes were open to the festivals, and it was a process, to all of a sudden I realized, oh, um, I need to follow the Torah. So um, let me tell you that there is a reconciliation process. In asking questions is, is, is not problematic. It's actually good. Um, but but uh, one day, this was uh, in, in the beginning of my walk in this, in this path, I was at a, a home Sabbath fellowship. And, you know, somebody else was leading the, the congregation or whatnot. So I brought my Bible and I sat in the chair and I went like this and I opened it up and I was just got it sat there. I was waiting, you know, five, ten minutes for things to start. And all of a sudden when I had it open, you know, there's a, nobody was doing anything. So I looked down here and I looked down and my eyes saw Romans chapter 3 verse 31. Now I've been going to church and I can tell you what's in the Bible whatnot. But it doesn't mean I had every verse memorized. I did not know Romans... I did not know Romans chapter 3, verse 31 was in my Bible because I was never quoted in church. Now, here's what it is. It says, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. So that was never quoted. That was the first time in my life I ever saw it. I was 30 years of age, and I've been going to church since I was five. Okay, that's the first time I ever saw it. So now I'm going to ask myself. Am I going to tell myself that that doesn't say we establish the law? I'm going to somehow kind of say I'm going to look at this and look at this and look at this, that somehow that doesn't say that. Is that really what I'm going to conclude? And I, and I said, that's impossible. I can read that a million times. It says every time we, now we is Jew and non-Jew. We establish the law. Now, I, that was so clear to me. I said, I have to accept that as true. That's my premise. Now, at that moment, can I explain to you Acts 10 or Acts 15 or Galatians? And what about what Galatians has said that? At that point in time, I didn't have an answer to everything. But this I was convinced of, that that verse said we establish the Torah is we establish the Torah. I have to work on my understanding of these other issues. Pray that they will come. Somebody that wants to argue with me, maybe I can't argue back with them. But... From that, it's clear to me that I'm supposed to establish the Torah. In the same way, um, to me, it's clear. It's a Babylonian calendar. It's clear. He said the sons of Zadok will rule in matters of country. That becomes my premise. Now, I don't know whether you ever thought about this, but whenever you try to make a point about something, you can call it an argument. Whenever you try to make a point and whenever you self-conclude, I believe this way. Whenever you say you believe this way or you try to convince somebody else in some way, whatever you're doing, it starts out with a premise. And what you do is you wrap your belief system around your premise. So if your premise is true, um, uh, then the things you wrap around it can be true. But the problem is if you start out with a faulty premise, then you can come to a wrong conclusion. So I'm telling you what my premise is. My premise is, uh, it is a Babylonian calendar, and it's not the character of Yeshua to follow the ways of Babylon. That's my premise. But if your premise is, well, I don't know, doesn't this verse say this, and doesn't that verse say that? If that becomes your premise, and you don't know how to interpret it, now you're coming from a different premise, so you're not going to accept things, because you're starting at a different point. So it's very important, and like Paul, like Paul said, what is your foundation that you have and what is your foundation that you build upon? So that's why I said to me, Babylonian calendar, and he said it matters of controversy. Now, after that, in my mind, I, I can take time to reconcile these things and questions that people have, and, but that's not going to remove me from my premise. Now, if you think my premise is wrong, now you could move me, but you got to go after my premise. Okay? So when people are asking questions, they're not necessarily at, they're at a different premise. All right. Brad. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm just, again, trying to pull some loose ends here together. So, yeah. and what came to mind is the verse where uh, his parents went to Jerusalem every year for the festival of Pesach. 
And when he was 12 years old, he, they went up to Jerusalem according to the practice of the festival. So what guidelines were they following at that time? Well, you have to go on the premise. Um, did he ever sin? No. Then he had to be following the Torah. So now mm -hmm. we are studying the scriptures. We're studying the Torah to find out what does the Torah say. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you start with the premise, he's not going to uh, disobey the Torah, mm -hmm. then um, mm -hmm. um, he's going to have to then be following the Torah properly. And now we come into the understanding that the proper following of the Torah is to, is to uh, follow the authority of the high priesthood which is accepting Yah's authority, and then he gives a prophecy to Phineas, and, and, and then, then he ultimately uh, affirms the sons of Zadok. Mm -hmm. And so, so in, in that way, um, uh, we have to accept that that is following Torah, and that is true, and when, then we have to read that into our understanding here. So my question is, do we assume the Zadok calendar overlaps with the... Babylonian calendar at this time, or am I misunderstanding what here? What do you mean by overlaps? Well, so who is over, so when he says the Passover, who's dictating the time at this juncture? Was he going when the whole, the well, majority of them were there with the, the priest? The, 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 the question's like, got to come, he's, uh, when he's 12, he's, he's, a child. he's, he's, he's following what his parents are doing. Right. Yes, and I understand, and that's part of the question okay, too. Okay, so the that's, question becomes. So now it's, it becomes deep. This is a layered question. Yeah, I understand sure. that. Yeah. The, that's where my mind the, went first. The, the question like, becomes is, is is his parents going to be following the Pharisees, or is his parents going to be following the Zadok priests? Right. Or is right. it his parents were following the Pharisees, but that's why. He didn't go back home with him at first, and he was sitting there laying down the law to the Pharisees when he was 12 years old. Right. <laughs> and they had to come back and get him. Right. So, where I'm coming from, though, yeah. if I have to try to figure that out yeah. for me to decide which calendar I'm following, yeah. um, I'm working on the wrong premise. If I'm trying to figure that out to reconcile what's going on, that's another issue. Okay, like what's going on in the day of Pentecost? Um, 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 why, why is apparently uh, uh, John's account of the last week and the last supper and the timing of it, why does it appear to be different than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Right, right. Okay, so one can conclude, one can say, well, it's unreliable. So the New Testament's unreliable. It's even unreliable. John three sixteen is reliable, and it's unreliable to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. You can go down that path. Oh well, no! <laughs> I'm not going down the path. Well, I'm saying you a, mean a generic you, you, right, person, right. you, somebody out in the world. You. Yeah, but it's these these little things that catch my attention, and because right. uh, one little thing can potentially take it a different direction. To me, it can't. It depends, well, right. it depends on your premise. Yep. If my premise is his character is not to follow the ways of Babylon and right. this is a Babylon calendar, it can't go another way. Right. So uh, it, you take the stance, I take the stance. At this point in time, I don't have an answer. Yeah. But I, am, I do know, like, can I explain everything in the Bible? No, but I am persuaded that Yeshua is the Messiah. Right, right. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with that. So am I going to explain what's going on in all these? Probably not, yeah. but but I am going to stick on it is a Babylonian calendar. Yeah. I am going to stick on his character is not to follow the Babylonian calendar. And I am going to stick on he said he recognizes the son of Zadok. I realize that's a tough question. But it's just something that I thought of. It's a valid yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, no, it, it, the Hebraic way is you ask questions that, that, that help everybody's understanding of clarity. <clears throat> and you only advance by asking questions. So asking questions and even tough questions is good. That's right. I think my, my premise kind of started in a different way. Okay. So through scripture where it um, references Enoch as prophesying, so he's a prophet, um, and then as scripture where it's talking about, have you not read, they don't marry in the heavens, that's the only place it's, um, it's listed. And Yeshua quotes that as scripture. So those kind of were 
um, my premise and what kind of brought me to it. I wasn't as aware. I have become aware, not to the detail that you've shared today, and I appreciate that, um, but I've been, I guess, slowly awakening to uh, the Zadok priesthood and um, everything that, that was going on at that time. But there are, I think, a lot of things, and I don't know, are you going to get into kind of some of those statements on Enoch later on? And um, I'm not gonna, really? I'm going to get into um, why was Yeshua called a Nazarene? And I'm going to get into what is the belief system that they had in the Qumran community? And how do we uh, relate and associate their belief system um, with uh, John the Baptist, with John the Apostle, with Paul? And we're and we're going to we're going to uh, try to kind of take that associate after um, um, learning of their belief system to see if their belief system um, uh, we can see in the scripture. Okay. And then finally, finally we'll, we'll get into the detail of the calendar itself. So there's a person, um, people have been asking questions. Um, I'd like to give the opportunity to, for someone online yeah. to go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello, can, can Tyler, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yes, sir. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, um, I was just kind of curious. Uh, thank you again, uh, Brother Chumney, for coming down and, and speaking with us on this, by the way. I can't say thank you enough. Um, I just was kind of curious. Uh, in Zechariah uh, 8.23, that's... Uh, uh, chapter 8 verse 23 yeah um it, I, I just kind of maybe you can give an understanding or your understanding of this verse um it says uh this is what uh of course it says yah almighty says in those days 10 people from all the nations will take firm hold of one jewish man by the hem of his robe and say let us go with you because we have heard that god is with you or elohim is with you so I, I was just kind of curious, um, you know, just trying to reconcile the two ideas together, what the Jews are doing now, um, you know, like capital J, you know, Jews, and versus, um, you know, the set up calendar and everything. Okay, like, like uh, you know, Scripture has multiple levels of understanding and multiple levels of interpretation. So um, taking different um, ways of interpretation um, about this verse to be saying. So what we what we might be trained to do, because in our generation, in our time, the Judaism that we have looked to see, which unless we study and learn, uh, it's thought that that is the Jewish people's viewpoint, because that's how it's presented uh, today, rather than realizing that at least Orthodox Judaism today is actually a sect that got got branched out, you know, going back several thousand years ago. So um, initially, um, we might read this um, uh, that we take the hold of, of the of him who is an Orthodox Jew and say God is with you. Well, why do we put in there Orthodox Jew for? Why don't we put in uh, conservative Jew? Why don't we put in um, reform Jewish? Or why don't we put in uh, the Karaites? Um, you know, why do we slot in it? Well, how, but our inclination to do that is because that's the first thing that comes to our mind because that's, it's in our world. So another way... Uh, another way to uh, look at that of him that is a Jew Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 2 uh, verse uh, uh, 28 and 29 he is not a Jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart in the spirit mm. and not of the letter so now we have a definition of what a Jew is a Jew is somebody who follows the Torah by the spirit and has a circumcised heart so I'm going to grab a hold of the hem who one follows the Torah with the help and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and I'm going to follow the Torah that way would you agree that Zechariah 8, right there, that portion is talking about the millennial reign? 
Um, I haven't examined it in the, in the fullness of it, but probably the application is going to extend into the Messianic reign. It, see, it seemed like it was prior, just it's the remnant prior to the millennium reign, or right at the beginning of it. Yeah, so, you know, it's what I'm saying again. Historically, because um, I've been in this for over 20 years, um, I know of those that read that and quote it and, and what, whatever, and they think of the application of, of, uh, of Orthodox uh, Judaism today, and they say, well, now we got to go run to the Orthodox Jews, and we need to follow and listen, and what they teach us and what they believe we got to do. Well, we can learn and glean from them, but we don't make them our ultimate and supreme authority in all Torah matters and all Torah doctrine. Okay, so um, uh, like I said, um, another, another thing is, I don't know if you thought about this, but the Judaism that's in our world today, it's an exile expression of faith. When Messiah comes and... and um, teaches the Torah from Jerusalem in Isaiah 2. Um, um, is it going to be the rabbis that's going to be leading the people mm -hmm. during the millennium? Nope. All right, so that means the Judaism that we have today is an exile expression of Jewish faith. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the ultimate and the restored expression of biblical faith. In the same way, the Christianity that we have today it's an exile expression of Christianity. Is this going to be called the faith in Yeshua in the kingdom? No. The same way, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but, but Messianic Judaism. You know what Messianic, what's, what's the Messianic Jewish organizations, um, what their doctrinal beliefs is? It's, it's, it's a mixture of belief that Yeshua is the Messiah where they've been taught and learned and they bring in the Christian dispensational teaching while trying to embrace their Jewishness following Orthodox Jewish custom. That So actually Messianic Judaism is an exile expression of Messianic Judaism. If you want to go to the original Messianic Jew, you got to go back to the Acts chapter 2. You got to go back to the very first Jewish believers to look at the original Messianic Jews and what the original Messianic Jews believed. And who were those Messianic Jews that believed predominantly? It were those from the Qumran. So if I'm going to go back to the Jewish roots of my faith in Messiah, I got to go back to the Qumran. And I got to see what they believed and how what they taught and believed became the foundation of first expression of faith in Yeshua. It, would it be okay? Can I mention just one other sure. Um, verse? It, sure. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. It, just in Matthew uh, chapter 23, uh, verse 1, um, I'm sure everybody's probably familiar with it. I don't, uh, but it, it says, Then Jesus spoke, or Yeshua spoke, to the multitudes, to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, Therefore, whatever they tell you to, uh, to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. And I mean, we could, I could go on further if you wanted okay, to. Okay, so, so the question is? Um, so I, I guess to just kind of confirm about the Jews and the, the authority, because he specifically says that the Pharisees are the ones that we're supposed to be listening to. Um, as far as the Torah is concerned. He didn't, if that's what he was teaching, he didn't even do that himself. Yeah. Okay? So here's an example that he didn't even do that himself, if that's what that really means. So in Matthew chapter 15, uh, uh, verses 1 to 3, then came to, then came to Yeshua scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So even today in Judaism, it is not recommended. It is required. And if you don't do this, you're not following Pharisaic law if you do not wash your hands before you eat. Um, so, so Yeshua did not do it, and he did not teach his disciples to do it. Then if we go to 
um, Luke in chapter 11 um, in uh, verses 37 and 38. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine him, and he went in to sit down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So if Yeshua said, follow what, do what the Pharisees did, now he's not doing it in front of a Pharisee. I think it's important to know what they did in that seat, though, because the Pharisees, when they sat in the seat of Moses, they only read the Torah, right? They weren't allowed to give their, well, their feedback. You know what it means? That's you, what know, you know what it means? So you know what it means to, to sit in Moses' seat? That means you're making rulings according to the Torah, okay? So now if you and I are sitting here in this meeting and, we're, and we in our meeting and, and we say, you know what, um, I'm here to present to you that um, the proper way to follow the Torah is to follow the Zadok priesthood and the Zadok uh, calendar. If I'm here to make that claim, which I am, um, you know what I'm doing? I'm sitting in Moses' seat. Why? Because I'm, I'm trying to teach the Torah and I'm trying to, uh, to, to show that um, this is the way of following the Torah. So, it's, so it would be a statement of fact. Now, one can say that you're not properly in that seat, that you should not have the ministry, that what you're teaching is wrong. But nevertheless, if all that might be the case, I'm still sitting in Moses' seat. When we, when we decide when we're going to keep the festivals, I'm going to do it the sliver or whatever, you're sitting in Moses' seat. So Yeshua was just making a statement of fact that when they had their Sanhedrin, um, they were making rulings according to the Torah, and those rulings that they were making, they were, that you might say, they were sitting in Moses' seat. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, but Nehemiah Gordon wrote a book um, where he uh, explained and went over this verse based upon what he believed to be an earlier accurate manuscript. And there are the church fathers that said that the book of Matthew was written in Hebrew originally. And there's a Shem Tov Hebrew, which is supposedly uh, be based upon the original. And um, in the Shem Tov Hebrew, um, uh, that is uh, not what this says, is that it doesn't say... Um, uh, therefore, whatsoever they bid you, that the Shem Tom Hebrew it says, whatever he tells you, whatever Moses is, Moses tells you. Now, I don't know how well you know Hebrew, he does. but but um, you know what the difference is between a resh and a dalit? It's whether you round, yes, it's whether you round it or or you make it square. You know, if you're doing the block letters, and so it's possible that in the copying and the scribes that that they that they may have missed something. You go from you know, say it one way to say it the other. But um, um, the other scriptures do not support the interpretation that we are supposed to follow and do with the Pharisees' rule because in Matthew chapter 16, um, Yeshua did the miracle of the feeding of the loaves and the fishes just to make a point uh, to his disciples that uh, don't follow the leaven of the Pharisees. So he's not going to not follow the Pharisees in washing bread and tell his disciples uh, to, to, uh, uh, to be on guard of the leaven of the Pharisees and then all of a sudden say, now follow the Pharisees. So he's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to contradict himself. Okay. On a different subject, Tyler, I don't know if you were, are you done? Because I have, I have a question. Okay. So on a, a completely different um theme or talk here, do you distinguish the sons of righteousness from the sons of Zadok? And Where's the sons of uh, righteousness mentioned? That's, well, the thought idea is you mentioned Zadok means righteousness. Zadok is actually the priest. Do you separate that idea of who's going to be the sons of Zadok in the future? Do you correlate them together? What um, is it? I, I actually believe who's going to be the sons of Zadok in the, uh, in the future are those who are literally descended of the sons of uh, Zadok, who only Yeshua knows. Uh, because uh, in, uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 66, in the restoration that, that uh, comes um, in the end of days, um, if we go to verse um, 21. Jeremiah 20. 
Uh, Isaiah 66, verse 21. I will also take... Mm -hmm. it says, of them, yes. That's the I'm going to take of them for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. The Zadoks are of the, the priests and Levites. So he says when he brings all his brethren an offering out of all the nations. Right, about all the nations. Is, uh, he's going to take of them that's coming out from the nations. Is that going in there, though? Yeah. So it would be the Gentiles that are eventually going to be recognized as Zadok? I don't believe that. You I, don't? Even if it says nations, is it going? It, well, in other words, these that he's taken are living in the nations, how mm, I render it. Okay. But um, you, you got to keep the Peshat, which is, it's the physical lineage of Aaron. It always was that way, understood that way. So therefore, the sons of Zadok in the kingdom has to be the descendants of Eleazar. He's not so, going to change it. No. So you um, do not ascribe to the idea that we are kings and priests, according uh, to First Peter? A Melchizedek priests, yeah. Those yeah. kings and priests that's referring to means Melchizedek priests. Right, so I'm saying it. Uh, the, so the I do. Themselves. I do believe that we are Melchizedek priests and Messiah. Okay. So I, I guess that's where there's a somewhat of a connection there, right? If you look at the the word Zedek, Melchi Zedek, right? Yeah. And so you, you made that point. So it seems almost like there's a connection that goes all the way to Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel 44 and even Isaiah 66, which you just read, Gentiles being kings and priests. Not, not not Zadok priests, Melchizedek priests. Melchizedek priests, sure, it's sure. It's a different priesthood. Okay, so then the Melchizedek, I mean the yeah, the Melchizedek priesthood is eternal. Right, you said Melchizedek is above the Zadok. I get that. The Melchizedek priesthood is eternal. The Zadok priesthood only came about uh, from the sin of the golden calf, wherein Aaron and the Levites then. Be, took the role of the priesthood of Israel and it served that priesthood office over Israel as the authority over Israel until Messiah is going to come and restore the original priesthood which is the Melchizedek priesthood so now in Messiah so now the Melchizedek priesthood is another name for it is the government of God and those who ultimately are, are in that place and position, an alternative name for that is the dwelling bride of Messiah. Okay, so now in Messiah, we, we are positionally, when we accept him, he is giving us an opportunity like Israel at Mount Sinai to rule and reign with him forever. So um, we are positionally in Messiah. He's restored unto us that uh, priesthood where uh, we can reign in life by taking his name and his and in his authority in the name of Yeshua be healed. Um, so when we're, when we're taking his name, we're taking his authority, taking his administration, we're operating in his government and government authority, we're operating as kings and priests. But um, if you study the, the priesthood, that just because you were in the line didn't mean you automatically uh, the position was sustained by unfaithfulness you could lose the status like Esau sold his birthright so positionally um, we are, are, are been given the opportunity to rule and reign with Messiah and his kingdom only through accepting him as the Messiah but our service in him, in living our lives, determines whether we're faithful or unfaithful. And when Yeshua gave the parable of the, of the wise servants, to the wise servants, he says, He's got, you're, you're going to rule with me, and he rebuked the, the wicked servants. So we are positionally kings and priests, and, and if we live our life unto him, submitted to his will, plans, and purposes, then we are ultimately going to be a part of his government and rule and reign with him, be a part of his bride and live with him in the Jew, New Jerusalem. But if we're unfaithful in our service to him, then we're going to lose out in being able to rule and reign with him. So when it talks about being kings and priests, it's referring to Melchizedek priests, not Zadok priests. Correct. So in the millennial reign, will it be the Zadok priesthood that is in place through Aaron, or will it be the Melchizedek priesthood that will be in place? Both. Both. Okay, okay so, so the Melchizedek will be above the Zadok priesthood is what you're saying. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we are Melchizedek priests as Cor of now. Correct. <clears throat> Thank you. That's all. I have a verse for you, too. Um, so if you go to Ezekiel 40, 
verse 46. So it talks about the Zadok priest ministering to Yahuwah. So whatever is happening in the temple, they're doing some type of ministering That's service. Correct. Whereas the Malkizedi is going to have a different role, whatever that is. But where, where were you? That was Ezekiel 40, verse 46. That's and, right. And you can see 40, Ezekiel 43, verse 19 as well. That's right. They are ministering in the temple right. and um, serving that function. Right. Now, um, uh, Yeshua is going to rule and reign with others in his kingdom. Who he's ruling and reigning with is his government. And, and the name of, of who he's ruling and reigning with <coughs> is, is, are the Melchizedek priests. And if we are faithful, we get resurrected to be in the kingdom and to rule and reign with Messiah. He's going to say, uh, uh, your uh, area of responsibility is over here to go teach the Torah over here. I'm in Jerusalem, but I'm sending you out over here. You're the minister over here. So now you are a part of his government, and, and, and you are a king and priest in his, uh, in his uh, messianic kingdom, uh, and, and you're, you're functioning in the role of the Melchizedek priest, which is a different priesthood and a different functioning than the Zadok priesthood that's operating primarily in the temple. Sure, I asked those questions for the edification of the people. I actually believe this, just as you said it. So I think it matters. Perfect, it, perfect. It, it matters. Because these things uh, get thought of or asked or at some point in time. So it's a good question. Are there any more questions, you guys? Y'all have been very good. You've been very good. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. I love uh, speaking in front of hungry and thirsty people. Amen. And all of y'all are have come here hungry and thirsty. Um, they traveled hours. Loving y'all, <laughs> wanting to know the truth. Just forty-five minutes. Um, <laughs> Aaron, forty-five minutes. And, and you know, <laughs> and, and entering in and. and being, being, being very, yeah. very serious. So I, really, I really appreciate it. We appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, We'd like to give a hand. Yeah.